Senators will take their seats. All persons not entitled to the privilege of the floor will please be seated in the gallery. The Senate will come to order. The session will be open with prayer. Prayer will be offered by the chaplain of the Senate. Today's chaplain is the Honorable Megan Martin, Secretary of the Senate. Please rise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to give you honor, glory, and praise through our words and our actions. We thank you for the opportunity to come and gather together this day. We ask for your blessings on this session of the Senate. We ask that you guide and direct our actions today so that they are full of wisdom, productivity, and respect for one another. Thank you for helping us to accomplish our work and our goals this day for the citizens of this great Commonwealth. Amen. Please remain standing and join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. The Chair wishes to thank uh, Megan for the prayer today. The next order of business is communications. From the President Pro Tempore. Communications from the President Pro Tempore. Consistent with the recess motion made on April 7, 2020, the Senate is recalled for voting session on Wednesday, April 15, 2020, at 11 a.m. Communications from the Governor. In accordance with the power and authority vested in me as Governor of the Commonwealth, I do hereby Refer to recall. the Committee on Rules. Communications. Communications from the House. The Clerk of the House of Representatives being introduced returned bill from the Senate numbered and entitled as follows, Senate Bill 613, with the information that the House of Representatives has passed the same with amendment, to which concurrence of the Senate is requested. Referred to the Committee on Rules further and further from the House. The Clerk of the House of Representatives being introduced informed that the House has concurred in the amendments made by the Senate to House amendments to Senate Bill numbered and entitled as follows, Senate Bill 841. The chair lays before the Senate Senate bills entitled numbered and referred as a followed, which the clerk will now read. Monday, April 13, Senate Bill 1075 referred to judiciary, Senate Bill 1107 referred to education, Senate Bill 1109 referred to labor and industry, Senate Bill uh, 1110 referred to health and human services, and Senate Bill 1111 referred to urban affairs and housing. The chair lays before the Senate Senate resolutions entitled numbered and referred as follows, which the clerk will read. Monday, April 13, Senate Resolution 323, referred to Veterans Affairs and Emergency Preparedness. The Chair wishes to announce that I sign in the presence of the Senate, Senate Bill 841. The next order of business, the leaves of absence. The Chair recognizes Majority Leader Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. No leaves at this time, Mr. President. For the purposes of leaves of absence, the Chair recognizes Senator Costa. Thank you, Mr. President. No leaves at this time. The journal of February 3rd, 2020 is now in print. The clerk will proceed to read the journal. The Senate convened Monday, February Chair recognizes 3rd. Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move we dispense with further reading the journal. The journal be approved. Senator Corman moves that further the journal be dispensed with and the journal be approved. On the motion, all those on the motion, the clerk will call the roll. Argyle. Aye. Aye. Arnold. Aye. Aye. Almet. Aye. Aye. Baker. Aye. Aye. Bartolotta. Aye. Aye. Blake. Aye. Aye. Boscola. Aye. Aye. Brewster. Aye. Aye. Brooks. Aye. Aye. Brown. Aye. Aye. Collette. Aye. Aye. Corman. Aye. Costa. Aye. Dinneman. Aye. Aye. DeSanto. Aye. Aye. Farnese. Aye. Aye. Fontana. Aye. Aye. Gordner. Aye. Haywood. 
Aye. Aye. Hughes. Aye. Aye. Hutchinson. Aye. Aye. Ivino. Ivino. Aye. 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 Carney. Aye. Aye. Killian. Aye. Aye. Langerholtz. Aye. Aye. Laughlin. Aye. Aye. Leach. Aye. Aye. Martin. Aye. Aye. Mastriano. Aye. Mench. Aye. Aye. Muth. Aye. Aye. Phillips Hill. Aye. Pittman. Aye. Aye. Regan. Aye. Aye. Sabatina. Aye. Aye. Senesero. Aye. Senesero. Aye. Aye. Scavello. Aye. Schwank. Aye. Aye. Stefano. Aye. Aye. Street. Aye. Aye. Tartaglione. Aye. Aye. Tomlinson. Aye. Aye. Vogel. Aye. Aye. Ward Judy. Aye. Aye. Ward Kim. Aye. Aye. Williams Anthony H. Aye. Aye. Williams Lindsay. Aye. Aye. Y'all. Aye. Aye. You did check. Aye. Aye. Scarnati. Aye. The vote on the motion, ayes 50, nay 0. The motion is carried and the journal is approved. Chair recognizes Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, as a special order of business, I'd like to turn to page six of today's calendar and ask for consideration of Senate Bill 1106. Uh, the bill on the calendar is Senate Bill 1106. Does the Senate agree to the bill? Agreed to. Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that Senate Bill 1106 be re-referred to the Committee on Appropriations. Senator Corman moves that Senate Bill 1106 be re-referred to the Committee on Appropriations. On the motion, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have the motion is carried. Next bill to be considered under special order of business is House Bill 1869. On page 7 of today's calendar, does the Senate agree to the bill? Agreed to. Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that House Bill 1869 be re-referred to the Committee on Appropriations. Senator Corman moves that House Bill 1869 be re-referred to the Committee on Appropriations. On the motion, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. For announcements, the Chair recognizes Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I request a recess of the Senate for the purpose of a couple of off-the-floor committee meetings to be held here on the floor of the Senate, starting with the Rules Committee, followed by the Appropriations Committee. Senator Corman requests a recess of the Senate for the purpose of two committee meetings. One is the Rules Committee, followed by the Appropriations Committee, to be held here on the floor of the Senate. The Senate is in recess. Next order of business is consideration of today's calendar. The first bill on today's calendar is House Bill 64. Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I request that House Bill 64 and remaining bills on page one of our calendar, as well as all the bills on page two, page three, and page four of our calendar, as well as the first three bills down to including House Bill 342 on page five of our calendar, go over in their order. Senator Corman requests that House Bill 64 on page one of today's calendar, through and including House Bill 342 on page five of today's calendar, go over in their order. Without objection, the bills will go over in their order. Next bill on today's calendar is Senate Bill 531. Senator Corman. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that Senate Bill 531 be laid upon the table. Senator Corman moves that Senate Bill 531 be laid upon the table. On the motion, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that Senate Bill 531 be taken from the table and placed upon the active calendar. Senator Corman moves that Senate Bill 531 be taken off the table and placed on the active calendar. On the motion, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Next bill in today's calendar is Senate Bill 565. Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I request that Senate Bill 565 and the remaining bills on page 5 of our calendar, as well as all the bills on page 6 of our calendar, go over in their order. Senator Corman requests that Senate Bill 565 on page 5 of today's calendar and all of the bills on page 6 of today's calendar go over in their order. Without objection, the bills will go over in their order. Next bill on today's calendar is House Bill 1796. Will the Senate agree to the bill? Agreed to. Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that House Bill 1796 be re referred to the Committee on Appropriations. Senator Corman moves that House Bill 1796 be re referred to the Committee on Appropriations. On the motion, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And the motion is carried.
Uh, reports of committee from Senator Corman, the Rules Committee, Senate bills reported as committed, Senate Bill 613, and Senate bills re-reported as amended, Senate Bill 327. As a special order of business, the chair recognizes Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, a special order of business, I ask to call up supplemental calendar number one. Senator Corman calls up as a special order of business, supplemental calendar number one. Without objection, we will proceed to consideration of supplemental calendar number one. The chair again recognizes Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that the Senate do concur in amendments made by the House to Senate Bill 613. Senator Corman moves that the Senate do concur in amendments made by the House to Senate Bill 613. On the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Bartolotta. President, um, give me a this on 613, correct? My sound was off. Yes, this is for the motion on Senate Bill uh, 613 to concur in the amendments that the House put in. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today in support of Senate Bill 613. The governor ordered the closure of all businesses not deemed, quote, life-sustaining on March 16th in response to concerns about the spread of the coronavirus. Although a haphazard waiver system was eventually created for businesses that wished to remain open, that process lacked any sense of transparency or accountability to the public, not to mention a great deal of confusion among all Pennsylvanians. Senate Bill 613 would create a better process for protecting citizens' health and determining which businesses can safely continue to remain open provide clarity on mitigation strategies necessary to protect the health and safety of both customers and employees, and give county leaders a stronger voice in which mitigation measures should be implemented locally. Specifically, Senate Bill 613 would require the governor to create clear guidelines for businesses to operate during the COVID-19 pandemic. Businesses that are able to operate safely under the guidelines would be permitted to reopen as long as they comply with mitigation strategies. It would also require COVID-19 mitigation plans to be developed by the Wolf administration based on the most recent guidelines issued by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. The legislation paired with Senate Bill 327 will put local communities in charge of when our neighbors can come back to work, not officials from other states. Adopting CDC standards will put health experts in charge, not state bureaucrats. This bill will allow county governments to develop and implement their own plans to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Governor Wolf's arbitrary decision about what businesses are essential and which aren't resulted in a quarter of the state's working population being unemployed. Over 1.2 million people are unemployed right now in Pennsylvania, leaving the state's unemployment compensation system severely overwhelmed. As a result, hundreds of thousands of displaced workers are struggling for hours on end and days to file claims, and tens of thousands more who are self-employed don't even have a way to file for new federal benefits that were approved recently by Congress. As chair of the Senate Labor and Industry Committee, I know that we must and we can do better for our communities. They deserve better. And SB 613 will create a path forward that continues to protect the lives of vulnerable Pennsylvanians without sacrificing the livelihoods of more than a million workers. I urge my colleagues to cast an affirmative vote on SB 613. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Chair, thanks, Senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Deniman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm going to reserve my comments for a remonstrance, and so I will pass at this time, Mr. President. The chair thanks the gentleman. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Boscola. President, uh, I offer these remarks in opposition to Senate Bill 613. I pride myself 
as a legislator on enacting and pursuing legislation that makes sense. I do believe that more businesses can be operating at this time while abiding by appropriate social distancing guidelines and requiring employers to provide appropriate protective equipment to employees, which is why I offered an amendment in Rules Committee to narrow the scope of Senate Bill 613. This, fall, this bill at the time, Senate Bill 613, it does go too far for this day and this time, and it doesn't protect employees enough. But Mr. President, I do want to safely and incrementally open up certain businesses here again in Pennsylvania. I have looked at other businesses that are operating in other states, and I believe we can and should be allowing more. Why, for instance, in New Jersey, can real estate agencies and car dealerships operate with appropriate regulations in place, but in Pennsylvania, we cannot? Why can we have landscapers working here, but not resident, residential home construction? And why can Home Depot and Lowe's operate, but a garden center cannot? These inconsistencies are concerning, but more importantly, how are we gonna recover? And it puts us at an economic recovery disadvantage, even to our other states. If these businesses can operate in surrounding states with appropriate safeguards, they can operate here in Pennsylvania. We must act in a responsible manner in a way that makes sense for people. While 613 certainly goes over the top, to do nothing is equally bad policy. We can open more segments of our economy and get people working again safely and responsibly. We cannot limp along requiring every business in Pennsylvania to apply for a waiver and hope for the best. There has to be middle ground here between us, one that can be supported in a bipartisan manner. Pennsylvania deserves representatives that set aside their partisanship and scoring political points. They deserve legislation that is rooted in common sense and will help our economy claw back. I'm willing to work with any of my Senate colleagues, and you know this, I always have, to put forward a sound plan to open those parts of economy that we believe can function with appropriate protection for Pennsylvania workers and citizens. My guiding principle remains as it always has been, does it make sense? Senate Bill 16 in its current form doesn't make sense at this time, but I am confident we can craft something that does. It's up to us as senators to work together toward that end. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Farnese. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise to uh, state my objections to, to 613. Um, you know, I think if we've learned a, a couple of lessons from this pandemic, the, the, the coronavirus pandemic of 2020, is number one is that uh, Dr. Levine's leadership um, and guidance through this pandemic, I think, is a uh, is a true asset to the Commonwealth. And number two is that is that sick, sick people should stay at home and not be at work. Um, you know, the, 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 the reference that, you know, the unemployment situation right now in Pennsylvania is the, is the uh, has anything to do with how the governor uh, rolled out his mitigation plan or any of the plans at, at the state level, I think are just, are just unfounded. Um, one of the reasons, one of the supporting arguments, Mr. President, in support of, of 613 was the fact that it allowed, a, uh, it allowed uh, the entire, uh, some parts of the state were not being affected as others were being affected. Certain parts of the state uh, were not, uh, the cases were not as prominent as they are in others like Philadelphia. But the point that nobody is, is, is really getting to, Mr. President, is, is it could be precisely because of the guidelines that are in place right now and the fact with the, with the stay-at-home orders and the restrictions that are in place right now, that is the reason why other parts of the state have not been affected and the virus is not as prominent as it is. 
if we do not continue to follow the directions of our uh, uh, of the Governor Wolf and Secretary Levin, that is a, a real serious concern of that happening. Um, if, if we have areas of the state right now where there is not a lot of cases, it could certainly be because of the measures that have been in place and they need to stay in place. And again, on 613 and, and the, the pieces that were put in, or at least the amendments that were tried to put in, like myself and others, um, specifically on the paid sick leave, no health expert would dispute that no employer who cares about his or her employees and his customers should encourage anything else. We need to do this. Philadelphia did this a few years ago. There was heartburn at the state level. Uh, some folks tried to preempt it. Um, but the truth is that if, if it was in place today in Philadelphia, it is in place. And because of that, 200,000 Philadelphians right now have protection under paid sick leave because we did it. If we had it in place today, right now across the Commonwealth, uh, we would have protection for people um, that need it the most. Um, and so again, I'm gonna be voting no on this bill, and I would ask others, uh, my colleagues, to support me in that. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator DeSanto. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today. The governor's business closure order and waiver process has been unfair and inconsistent from the beginning. He has rejected efforts by the legislature, business community, and labor organizations over the past four weeks to allow reasonable and responsible operations to continue. His extreme approach has forced more than 1.3 million Pennsylvanians out of work so far, put businesses at risk of permanent closure, and imperiled the long-term health of Pennsylvania residents and our economy. Today's action by the Pennsylvania State Senate would, if signed by the governor, bring much needed fairness and consistency and a new level of transparency to the business closure rules. I would encourage everyone to <clears throat> reach out to the governor's office and encourage him to support this legislation and begin implementing it immediately. Other states and countries have been able to maintain additional business activities and employment, and Pennsylvanians must be afforded the same freedom to take appropriate precautions about their lives and livelihood. This legislation is optional for business owners and employees and customers. If someone doesn't want to follow applicable safety protocols and open their businesses, work, or shop, they shouldn't. Pennsylvanians can allow businesses to operate safely and at the same time continue to support our health care system and frontline emergency responders. Thank you. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Collette. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to offer comments to Senate Bill 613. Like many of you, my staff and I have spent the past month working with constituents facing unimaginable challenges. Every day, I know that the people in my district and across the Commonwealth wake up scared, scared that they or their loved ones will get sick, scared that they won't be able to pay their rent or buy groceries, scared that they will have no choice but to go to work in warehouses, offices, job sites that they know are not equipped with the equipment and resources necessary to protect their safety. And while those advocating for the passage of SB 613 vow that businesses will provide the PPE needed to keep their employees safe from this deadly virus, there is no question that masks, gloves, and other protective equipment are in short supply and that those supplies must go to our frontline caregivers first and foremost. Like you, there is nothing I want more than to offer Pennsylvanians a return to normalcy and a return to economic stability. But I cannot in good conscience vote for a bill that disregards the recommendations of the nation's top medical and public health experts. As a nurse, I believe it would violate my duty of care to support a bill that our state's top health official, Dr. Rachel Levine says, quote, would be reckless and irresponsible and quote, place more lives at risk. Make no mistake, the outcome of today's vote will cost or save lives, and we must save lives before we can save livelihoods. 
I don't wish to keep businesses closed a day longer than necessary. I have the greatest respect for the hardworking men and women in the construction industry, and it breaks my heart to have to make this choice. But as a nurse, I know that if this shot will save your life, I'm not going to withhold it just because you don't want to feel the pinch. Until we further flatten the curve, until we have adequate supplies of tests and concrete plans to expand testing, until we address the shortages of personal protective equipment, not just in our hospitals, but in our nursing homes, physicians offices, pharmacies, grocery stores, and on public transportation, and until the medical and public health experts agree, we aren't ready. We can't afford to be wrong here when the price is our families and our community members' lives. I will be voting no on this bill today, Mr. President, and I urge my Senate colleagues to make the choice that we all know will save lives and join me in voting no. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the Senator. Further on the motion, the Chair recognizes Senator Tartaglione. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to highlight some measures that are conspicuously missing from the current version of Senate Bill 613, provisions that we proposed earlier today in committee as part of an omnibus amendment and would have provided vital emergency relief for the many Pennsylvanian workers and their families during this unprecedented health crisis. I'm speaking of Pennsylvanians who work at food processing and protein plants, those who work in grocery stores and drug stores, as well as nurses, doctors, EMTs, police, firefighters, pharmacists, and so many others who are working on the front lines of this pandemic. The mere fact that these folks can continue to work day in and day out is a testament to their dedication to their jobs and to the essential nature of the work. The language I propose would have formally designated those who work at food processing and protein facilities, as well as those who work at grocery stores and drug stores throughout the Commonwealth as essential and frontline employees for all matters, including but not limited to childcare, workplace safety, and paid leave. It would have required employers to adopt small, robust social distancing standards, including the allocation of more space for employee break and meal periods, staggering start times and break times, and the reduction of meetings and training group sizes. Among other social distancing requirements, the amendment would have reduced the frequency of reassignment for temporary employees among different facilities. It also would have limited the number of outside visitors to the workplace to further reduce the risk of COVID-19 exposure. It would have required employers to increase the frequency and thoroughness of cleaning in all facilities while allowing employees more time to wash hands and sanitize. It would have guaranteed that employees who are forced to leave their jobs due to illness or quarantine would continue to receive full regular financial compensation and would get to keep their prior health coverage. It would have guaranteed the right of these workers to take leave without sanction or penalty to care for a family member or a child during this emergency. If an employee tests positive in a workplace, the amendment would have required employers to follow specific immediate protocols for sanitizing and workplace and for granting paid leave to other potentially exposed employees at their regular rate of pay. The amendment would have required employers to post and communicate these policies and protocols in the language spoken by employees to ensure that workers are able to understand these protections. In addition, the amendment would have mandated additional cleaning and personal hygiene protocols for grocery and drug stores including reduced hours of operation, increased spacing for active checkout stations, scheduling for hand-washing breaks. Last but not least, 
my language would have provided essential workers who test positive for COVID-19 with a presumption of workers' compensation el eligibility so that they would not have to prove where they contracted the virus. The reality is, in today's environment, Exposure to this virus is an occupational hazard for workers in essential occupations. Therefore, COVID-19 must be classified as an occupational disease. Each day, more and more essential workers are exposed to COVID-19 and are testing positive for the virus. Mr. President, time is of the essence. We must act now to help them. All essential workers and their families should be incredibly disappointed that the Senate is not advancing legislation to give them the cr critical emergency relief. I ask for negative vote. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the Senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Mensch. Hey, I, I don't believe there's a legislator in the House, the Senate, Republican or Democrat, who wishes ill for any of our workers, for any of our citizens. But there's a real reality out there that we have um, gone a little bit too far in some of our regulations and controls over who can work and who can't work. And the amendment from the House in 613 begins to provide some more judicious management of the process. Uh, Mr. President, we have, um, we want people to stay at home. We don't want to spread the coronavirus. You know who's staying at home? More than a million point three new unemployed sitting on the couch with no paycheck. That's what we're doing to our economy right now, Mr. President. There's got to be a compromise between where we are and where some people suspect the Republicans want to take this. I don't believe the Republicans want to take this as far as is being insinuated in, in much of the debate here today. I believe that we want to give the authority uh, or put greater structure around the authority and uh, begin to have more transparency. This is an administration that for six years has argued for transparency and now doesn't want to share any of the data. Um, I find that kind of uh, in incredulous. And I think that we have to begin to, to force the, the administration to work with us and begin to manage this much more practically. Mr. President, over the weekend, there were 13 countries in Europe that uh, their, their legislator, uh, legislatures wrote a joint letter to their collective CEOs, chief executive officers of the, of the government, suggesting that they were concerned, they, the legislator, was, were concerned that the chief executives were taking too much power in this crisis. That's uh, a sentiment that I hear all the time. We've talked about the emails that we get. So many of the emails that I receive are speaking to the fact that the, the governor is too empowered to act way too unilaterally in this process. So I believe that we need to put some curbs or bumpers around this as uh, the terminology in the legislature often goes. I also want to point out, Mr. President, uh, an article today that was in uh, the morning news from, from The Economist magazine, certainly not a conservative publication by any stretch. Uh, they're citing that in France, in India, they've extended shutdowns. So there are some countries that are doing that. They've also said that in Italy and, Aust and Austria, they are now beginning to loosen restrictions. Italy, we all know what we were hearing about the death rate in Italy. They also suggest that Spain has people back at work. China has people back at work. So there is, a, there is a more practical reality to this problem, and that is that we can evolve forward with this if we do it with the proper management, the proper structure. CDC, the uh, Homeland Security, they provide great guidance in this regard. Many of the other states in our nation are doing that. Uh, previous speakers spoke about car dealers that are effectively working in, in New Jersey. Uh, being from the Southeast, we're losing customers right now, and I can tell you that, I'll show you the emails, but we're losing people that are going to other states to do business. We have people that are going to Delaware to buy their booze. We, we have way too many constraints on this process, 
that Mr. President would make sense if we could lift some of these and move forward. Earlier today also, there was a forecast by the IMF or the International Monetary Fund suggesting that the world economy has now slipped about 3%. Their caution is that if slip any further, will be as bad as the Great Depression. When we had the Great Depression, we had one third of the people in America that we have today. And we were a manufacturing nation. And here we are now a service nation, Mr. President, which will require a, a longer time to recover. And we're risking a Great Depression. I think the reality here is that we need to do something for our economy, for our people, help these people get back to work. Someone said earlier, uh, uh, citizens are scared. Yeah, they're scared. They're scared that they can't pay for their mortgage. Uh, they're afraid they can't buy food. They're afraid they can't put the kids in school. There's a great deal of concern in our country, Mr. President, right now for, and in our state, for the economic situation that people have been boxed into. Nothing they did but they're being asked to suffer immensely in their personal lives when we, the legislature, can begin to work with them and provide some greater guidance and put some greater control over the, the unitary or the unilateral uh, power that the governor has assumed in this case. So, Mr. President, um, I ask for an affirmative support, uh, excuse me, vote on Senate Bill 613. Thank you very much. Chair, thanks, Senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Santorcero. President, uh, Mr. President, I rise uh, in opposition to Senate Bill 613. Uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic, the likes of which none of us has ever experienced before. It truly has upended not only our state, uh, but all the states, and not only the United States, but the entire world. Now, early on, the goal across this country was to try to contain the virus. Unfortunately, the slow and ineffective response of the federal administration made that goal impossible. And so quickly, it moved, it shifted to mitigation. And again, because of some of the problems at the federal level, many of the states had to take uh, the leading war in mitigating the spread of this virus. Governor Wolf and our administration here in Pennsylvania took the bull by the horns and led, ultimately shutting down the state. Now, as many of the speakers before have said, I will echo, we are all sympathetic to the businesses that have been shuttered, to the workers who have been put on the unemployment rolls, to the families who are wondering about what the future holds. These are serious issues and there needs to be a serious and robust response to make sure that we can get the economy moving again when the time is right. And that needs to be a response at the federal level as we've seen with the various stimulus bills that have been passed already. And even here in Pennsylvania, as we've seen with some of the measures that this legislature and the governor's administration have undertaken. But the first order of business or any of that has to be that we protect the public health and we save lives. Public health experts and the medical experts here in Pennsylvania and across the country have repeatedly said that unless we do our work to flatten the curve, our healthcare systems are going to be overwhelmed. And when that happens, people die. We saw what happened in other countries, in Italy and Spain, for example, and even here in the United States, in New York, where the effects of the virus have been most pronounced because of the density of population. Hospitals throughout the city of New York were overwhelmed. And even now, the death toll is staggering in that state. So far, we've been able to avoid the worst of that here in Pennsylvania, precisely because Governor Wolf instituted a broad lockdown of the state. Now, it's true that the rate of increase of new cases seems to be leveling off for the time. And if indeed that trend continues, then it's an example of the fact that the mitigation that has been undertaken to date has been successful. 
This is not a time, however, in reaction to that news to take our foot off the pedal. All of the health experts, including Dr. Levine, as was currently, as was previously mentioned, have made it clear that if we were to broadly open up business in Pennsylvania, as is contemplated and would happen under Senate Bill 613, we would see a spike in new cases. Everything we've done over the last three or four weeks to prevent that from happening would be undone. And not only would that be a, a public health catastrophe, but economically, it would set us back months. Because once again, we would have to go into a broad lockdown. And God only knows how long that would take as a consequence of the fact that we would now have a healthcare system that's overwhelmed. Now, the governor has decided, I think, uh, rightly, to join with other states here in the Northeast on putting together a plan that is, will be informed by medical science and healthcare professionals as to how we can slowly reopen our economy when the, when the time is right. Why working with those other states? Because our economy and in fact our people are intertwined with those other states. And it makes sense that we coordinate our efforts with them. Now I know uh, some of my colleagues have stated, well, why aren't you choosing other border states like Ohio and West Virginia? That's not a question for Governor Wolf. That's not a question for this General Assembly. That's a question for those states, ultimately. They have to make the decision as to whether they're gonna act in unison with us and our neighbors. But ultimately, that plan will enable Pennsylvania as the health crisis begins to stabilize, to slowly and deliberately open sectors of our economy in a way that gets people back to work while at the same time protecting public health and safety. Now, this is not going to be easy, and I don't know what the new normal will be even when we start to do those reopenings. But what's clear to me is that we cannot get this wrong. We cannot simply decide that we're going to do a broad reopening of businesses right now and risk the consequences that can occur to both health and ultimately to the lives of many Pennsylvanians. We get that wrong. It's not just a mistake that we make legislatively or um, in the economy. It's a mistake ultimately that could have an impact on whether people live or whether they die. This is not the time to do this. We can take a much more methodical, deliberate approach and we can do the right thing, both for the health and safety of our constituents, as well as the health and safety of our, and of our economy in the long run. It's gonna take a concerted effort, but it can be done. I urge that all of us vote against Senate Bill 613. There is a better way to go about what we're trying to do here, and this is not it. This is not the time to let up on the pedal. This is not the time to jeopardize public health and safety. Time to stand with the governor, to stand with Secretary Levine, and make sure that we give our frontline medical and health workers the time that they need to treat people, and ultimately then begin to open the economy again and get people back to work and provide them with all the resources and all the benefits and support that they need to do that. We can do that together, Democrat and Republican. But now is not the time to risk the lives of the people of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair, thanks, Senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Martin. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise today asking my colleagues to support Senate Bill 613 because I want to offer the people of Pennsylvania who are worried about their health, I want to offer the people of Pennsylvania who are worried about their livelihoods more than sympathies. 
more than attaboys, is to address the confusion, the chaos, and the favoritism and lack of transparency that has been implemented in this shutdown. Make no mistake about it, Mr. President, People would like you to think that the idea that either one side wants to have health and the other side wants our economy to pick up, they are not mutually exclusive goals. We are the ones in our home community that are looking at folks in our face who say, I've settled on one house, but I can't move into my other. I have nowhere to live. What do I do? or I'm stuck with two mortgages, what do I do? We're the ones with constituents who see every state surrounding us allowing construction, allowing auto sales, and allowing other types of business, saying, why are we different? We're the ones that have to come up with the answer. I'm looking at the state's e-commerce portal today. And I see a solicitation by the administration for two Ford Expeditions Limited posted on April the 10th with solicitations due by April the 17th. Who's supposed to bid on that? Ohio? West Virginia? They're allowed to do that. I give amazing kudos to the folks who are out there right now operating and the safety guidelines, whether it's the butcher down the street from me, whether it's Weiss Markets up the streets, whether it's the True Value that's open selling supplies and seeing all the amazing things that the private sector is implementing in terms of safe guidelines, not only for its employees, but for the customers that come through their door. This discussion does not have to be about things that are mutually exclusive. I have homes waiting to be finished for construction so families can move in. We have 1.3 million Pennsylvanians who no longer can work, who are trying to get through in order to apply for unemployment compensation, who cannot get an answer. And you know what scares that? scares me about that? Not only people who aren't getting money to take care of themselves, but yesterday I got sent pictures of this wonderful food bank in Lancaster County called Blessings or Hope. They provide three to four million pounds of food every month to those who are in need. Yesterday I got sent the pictures of an empty warehouse. They're completely panicking because the supply chain is broken. They realize that farmers, dairy folks, and everyone else are, who are completely disjointed are dumping food. There's no way to transport it. They can't have their normal people operating with them. We have so much to fix in order to make these two goals happen. What this would do in Senate Bill 613 is be transparent which if there's a single person in this body or the chamber across the hall that says that this process has been fair and transparent, they're kidding themselves. As I look in my district at two different employers who do the exact same thing, one gets a waiver, the other doesn't. How am I to answer that? To the thousands of my employers who never even got a response back. To the fact that they allowed Penn Manor High School to continue with their $100 million construction project in order to be able to have school on time in August, yet they denied St. John Newman and the elementary school that's being built that it's faced with the same timelines to start school in August. Is that consistency? Is that fair? We've had individuals go through every single state's guidelines in terms of what they're operating for. We have discovered 45 states, 45, that are operating under the Centers for Disease Control and the CISA guidelines. Transparent, gives good guidance, doesn't pick winners and losers, 
and gives people the comfort of safety and health recommendations that they can operate for their employees and for their customers. I appreciate the efforts and I know the governor's intentions were very well intended in terms of wanting to flatten that curve and that spike and its impact on our health care system. But it's time for him to coordinate with us. It's time for him to also stand with the people of Pennsylvania who always asked me the question, I could have five baristas standing in the Starbucks who are practicing, and God bless them, amazing safety protocols in doing their job in this tight little section at Starbucks, but they want to know why we can't trust the people of Pennsylvania who may work in construction to follow the same social distancing practices and to do their job safely. Yes, they want to be safe. But yes, they also want to work. And in closing, Mr. President, I'll just say this. We have a responsibility here in this capital to take care of the folks who need help, who have been unemployed, who have been impacted by this. We all know that our systems are tremendously overwhelmed, and we all know the massive budget hole that we're faced with. It's another motivation. We need those revenues. We need people to be able to do residential real estate, to be able to do construction, to do online auto sales. That also generates tax revenue that we're going to turn around and also fund programs that are going to help people during these times. So if you stand for transparency, if you stand for wanting to make sure people are healthy, and if you want to stand to ensure that we can do this and get our economy going again at the same time, I'd ask you and my colleagues to please support Senate Bill 613. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair, thanks, the Senator. Further on the motion, the Chair recognizes Senator Muth. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today with immense concern for the people of our Commonwealth and therefore um, in opposition of Senate Bill 613. Uh, allowing businesses to reopen in, without adequate testing, which means mass testing of the people of our Commonwealth. Um, we have yet to uh, test 1% of our population. Um, the numbers reported that are low in some of the counties that um, have not been hit like mine um, are because we don't have access to test kits. We don't have the ability to mass test. Uh, this virus is everywhere. This virus does not um, have a cure, does not have a vaccine. There is no township, state, borough, uh, country for that matter on this earth that has the capacity to provide a solution to stop it from killing people. In the absence of having adequate supplies, not just test kits, but protective equipment, cleaning supplies, it is virtually impossible to safely operate businesses and keep both workers and our community safe. And I have yet to hear from everyone who wants to open the floodgates from which of course is a flawed trans in lacking transparency process with waivers. I've yet to hear the plan as to how we're gonna provide worker and each person in this commonwealth with the adequate protection so that they are not harmed by this virus. I get it. I have lots of constituent inquiries. Our inbox is full. Senate District 44 was the first hard hit district in this commonwealth, taking out entire police departments for me. I had six, six veterans die in the same veterans home this week. Six, I would love to know how many of my colleagues are able to identify how many people in their county have actually been tested. How many people know how widespread this virus is? We don't know. And that is step one into ensuring we have a safe return for businesses to reopen, for schools to reopen. I can't explain to my constituency why there is a pipeline being drilled in their backyard that's deemed essential when it's supposed to allow natural gas liquid to be used to make plastics overseas and how that is essential. I get it. 
I fight those waivers too. The answer is not to give everybody access to do whatever they want in the absence of protections. And I'm, I'm, I'm offended that there are members of this General Assembly that want to talk about the lengths of food pantry lines when the, the, we have failed to raise the minimum wage, when we have members of this Senate vote to gut the general assistance program, putting people back to work and rejuvenating an economy, that's doable. We cannot bring people back from the dead. That's impossible. And while we have this back and forth, um, losing customers is nothing compared to losing lives. Explain that to the families that are in your districts that have, are going to, if they have not already had deaths because of this virus. There's no stopping it. That is why we have to do, we have no alternative but to stay at home, social distance, construction companies taking away supplies that are not available for our nurses, that are not available for our frontline workers. It's, it's, it's unacceptable. We don't have these resources yet. And the absence of a plan to acquire these resources, reopening businesses is negligent. Your harm will happen. It will increase. Death numbers will increase. We know this. There's no compromise when we're dealing with a life-threatening virus that does not have a cure, it does not have a vaccine. The economic frustrations we all share, the solutions to those cannot entail allowing more people to die from this virus. Don't make this virus partisan. It's not. It kills Republicans, Democrats, independents, and everyone else. So I urge a no vote. I urge that we come back and visit this. I urge public investment in our health system. We are one of the worst ranked states in the nation for our state investment in our public health structure. I don't know any infectious disease experts in our Senate. So if I miss that, I'd appreciate your feedback, but otherwise we cannot, as a single body, make decisions about people's health and well-being. There are people that are able to help guide us to make these decisions. And if we have um, the effort to make that plan work, it does work. But don't tell me about CDC guidelines that are cherry-picked when a major CDC guideline was to allow for vote by mail but instead we prefer to pack polling locations. Don't make this partisan. There are people looking to every single one of us to get our act together and save lives. Transparency during a pandemic is imperative. Wholeheartedly agree. Waiver processes, none of this is going to be perfect. In the absence of a vaccine, we cannot open the floodgates to allow this to spread further than it already has. I ask for a no vote today and I ask for all of us to come back and have this conversation about a real plan and work with the administration and work with health experts to establish that plan and implement that plan. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair, thanks, Senator. Uh, further on the motion, Senator Phillips Hill. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to express my strong support for Senate Bill 613. I look around the Senate chamber. I see some of my colleagues wearing masks and gloves and protective gear. Some of my colleagues, they're voting via Zoom meeting because of unprecedented rules that this body had to pass to address a worldwide pandemic. We are seeing frontline employees demand, they're being demanded to be there because they are essential. They are risking their lives to go to and from their places of employment to care for others. 
and we are grateful. We are so very grateful for healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, for delivery drivers and grocery and convenience store employees, for nursing home staff, for our first responders, our police, our firefighters, our emergency medical staff. So many brave men and women who are continuing to keep the essential services running in our Commonwealth and all across our country. This truly is a national crisis. This past weekend, those of us of the Christian faith, we celebrated one of the holiest of holidays on our calendars. But it was without family, without friends, without loved ones. Yes, the sacrifices that we had to make this weekend to cancel traditions we've held dear for so many years pale in comparison to the sacrifices our essential workforce have made each and every day during this pandemic. Today's action by the Senate is an attempt to bring well thought out, nationally normed federal guidelines to assure safety to our Commonwealth. In fact, as referenced by my good colleague from Lancaster County, 45 other states in our nation follow these very federal guidelines devised by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency of the United States Department of Homeland Security under the CDC's standards for the health and safety of our citizens. Now, the governor has expressed his desire for collaboration, and while I may disagree, with collaborating with elected officials in other states, states like Rhode Island and Massachusetts, Delaware, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. I would like to note that the majority of these states are implementing the guidelines that we are debating here today. And as a matter of fact, the states that are not, they have many more businesses open in their states. So you could say, that this legislation would simply put Pennsylvania on level ground with all of the states that the governor would like to collaborate with to reopen our Commonwealth for business. And I agree that during this national crisis that we need more collaboration. And I'm hearing from women and men who are adversely impacted by the shutdown, hardworking Pennsylvanians, employees and employers, small business owners, independent contractors, we need to collaborate with them. They could easily operate under CISA guidelines and CDC standards, but because our Commonwealth has implemented an arbitrary and opaque list, as opposed to a systematic and transparent list, they cannot operate or they risk punishment. Their very livelihoods are on the line and they are forced to remain unemployed or shuttered. Meanwhile, we've got big box stores that can operate. Questions come up over and over again. What can be open? What cannot be open? I'm sure I am not alone having to answer and clarify what the governor's life-sustaining list includes and does not include. So let me be clear. Every business is life-sustaining. Every business employs people and helps them to put roofs over their heads, meals on their tables, and clothing on their backs. On Monday, I had to deal with a local crisis created by the governor's arbitrary list. The governor's non-life-sustaining list included a vendor that the County of York uses called VigilNet America LLC. For those of you who don't know, VigilNet is the York County Court's primary vendor for electronic monitoring of defendants both pre-trial and post-conviction who would otherwise be incarcerated. They were ordered to shut down because they were denied a waiver by the administration. If VigilNet shuts down, the York County Court will have little choice but to return these defendants to the county prison. 500 inmates in total. Meanwhile, at the same time, the administration was putting together plans late last week to release inmates from state correctional facilities. Fortunately, we were able to keep this company 
and the services that they provide operating after having to send an 11th hour letter to the governor who said that they would receive an email response in a few days allowing them to operate. This is just one example of so many of an arbitrary list that lacks transparency, clarity, and consistency. I should not have had to send a letter for this company. There is already a list at the federal level that 45 other states have found to be effective. Yet, if we listen to the opponents, we will leave here today and be forced to explain to our constituents again how big box stores can be jammed packed with customers while small businesses that could adhere to CDC guidelines must remain closed. We would have to go back to our districts and continue to explain that the Unemployment Compensation Center is overwhelmed with 1.4 million new claimants. Let me say that again, 1.4 million new claimants and people cannot get the assistance that they need. Employees who could be working under strict CDC guidelines are instead forced to stay home, wait on hold with the Department of Labor and Industry about their unemployment compensation claim while 45 other states allow certain industries to continue to operate. In the end, the current process has created more confusion and that confusion has begun to lead to chaos. And that is why we are here today, to say we want to collaborate with the people of Pennsylvania. We want to collaborate with the governor and the General Assembly. And based on what I am hearing from my constituents, this is the best path forward during this crisis. Protecting public health and worker safety by adhering to CDC guidelines in a place of employment and protecting our economic health, these are not mutually exclusive goals. Now, some of our colleagues have put forward a false narrative here today, that the only way to improve public health is shutting down the economy, and that any improvement to the economy would come at the expense of the public health. Nothing could be further from the truth. Senate Bill 613 charts Pennsylvania on a better path to recovery. It is the same path 45 other states have opted to use following this pandemic. If the governor believes in collaboration, let's collaborate and move away from an arbitrary process that has some companies being granted waivers while other similar companies are denied waivers and stay closed. Let's end the unfairness in the process. Let's end the confusion we're all trying to explain. Let's work together. Let's be transparent and open, and let's be consistent. Let's assure our public health. Let's assure our workforce safety. Let's assure our economic health. As a commonwealth and as a nation, let's come together to protect lives and adhere to CDC guidelines that red states and blue states, 45 in total, have found to be effective. Let's pass Senate Bill 613. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Schwenk. That this pandemic has proven to us is most certainly some of the inequities in our society that have really been highlighted by the fact that people do not have good health care. People do not have safe workplaces. People do not have decent housing. They do not have the opportunity to have adequate childcare so they can send their children to, to school and to be educated as well. So the question as to whether this bill is the right thing to do, I really can't answer that now because I think the timing is wrong. We're not ready. We are not ready to totally reopen every business in the Commonwealth, because we don't have a number of things in place to make that a safe environment. Number one, we don't have adequate testing. How do we know, for example, on a construction job, if there is an individual there that is a silent carrier of the coronavirus? We don't know because generally they're not testing. You can put masks on all the people that you want to, but we absolutely have to know and be able to put in quarantine people who are carriers of this virus. The other issue is the issue of protective equipment. 
we already know that so many of us have made you know, really dramatic attempts to try to get masks, to try to get gowns, to, to try to get the kinds of equipment that our healthcare workers need in order to do their jobs. If they don't have enough equipment, how can we possibly redirect more to some other businesses? I just don't feel that we are prepared at this moment to take this step. It will come, and believe me, just like the rest of you, I want just as badly to see our economy restart. I have very personal reasons for that, as well as my entire district, who, people who are anxious to get back to work. But make no mistake, there are people that are concerned too. Even in businesses that have received waivers, have you not heard the same complaints that I have from people who say, wait, I don't want to go back to work. I have an elderly person at home that I'm caring for. I don't want to bring the virus back to my children in my home. So, you know, it's a mixed bag. Not, yes, we are all concerned about our jobs. We're concerned about where the money's going to come from to pay the rent, to pay the mortgage, to buy food. But the first thing, first things first, we've got to focus on our personal safety. And our jobs as senators is to make sure that we do protect the people of the Commonwealth, that we protect our constituents, while at the same time building and creating the environment where they can go back to work safely. You know, time after time, we've heard and we've seen these, these folks on TV, these heroes. We call them heroes and rightfully so. They're the people in the hospitals the emergency room doctors, the, doc the nurses, the people that are cleaning the hospitals, the people on the front lines in grocery stores and in food processing plants. We've seen them and we've heard from them talking about their concerns. But the one message that should hit home to us the most is that what they have said is, if we open up too quickly, if we try not to stay at home, and follow the guidelines that we've been carefully following for at least some time now, we are going to see an onslaught of this virus. We are, going to, we are going to put them in the position where they're not going to have the personal protection and the safety that they require as well. We're not ready for this yet. I urge the governor to continue to look at how we cooperate with those other states, those other governors, cooperate with the uh, business community as well as the legislature to see how we build a thoughtful plan to come back, to bring our economy back, but to bring our health back too. We don't have to make that choice, but we start by being safe right now. And I urge my colleagues to consider the vote that they're making today and the position that you're putting some people in particularly our healthcare workers, if we take this vote. We're making their lives that much harder and that much more dangerous. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the Senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Mastriano. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in favor of Senate Bill 613. As a 30-year active duty military held as a veteran in the United States Army, just two years out of uniform, Vectors and pandemics is something we study ever since I wore the uniform in 1986. We had fears back then during the Cold War that the Soviet socialists would use that as an indirect way to attack our economy. Alas, the Soviets did not go that way, and the pandemic came inadvertently from China, but it's having the exact effect and impact that we feared it would had the Soviets done the same during the Cold War. Lost in this debate from a national strategic perspective is the economy. Our lives, well-being, and our health care system are tied to it and cannot exist without it. That's why we fear the Soviets would attack us indirectly with a vector or pandemic during the Cold War. And this is exactly what's coming about now. My fears are borne out that the heavy-handed approach regarding the economy in Pennsylvania will have far-reaching effects that will live on long past our time. We are indeed in the greatest crisis of our lifetimes, yet the impact of this crisis is far worse than it needs to be. I regret to say that I fear the cure may well indeed prove worse than the disease. 
The one-size-fits-all approach to choose which businesses can and cannot remain open defies reason and logic. This combined with the cloak of secrecy surrounding the waiver process is distressing and needlessly causing the ruination of thousands of our people's lives. Furthermore, the proposition that this is an either-or decision is absurd. Our people are crying out for action. They're calling out for reason and common sense to prevail. The mischaracterizations and slogans fly in the face of what Senate Bill 613 is designed to do. Our constituents are growing weary of the dithering and look to us to do the good, transparent, and appropriate and safe thing. Yet many questions remain. How is it that Pennsylvania is the only state in the nation that forbids car sales, golf courses to be open, forbids all types of construction, and even now moving to close garden shops? The inconsistency of these decisions is not lost on any person in the state. Meanwhile, aisles packed with shoppers in superstores and food stores go on where I postulate is not a safe environment from a COVID-19 perspective. Or the dangers that exist in our beautiful big cities where mass transit continues to operate and is a more likely place to spread the virus, while many, many businesses and functions across the Commonwealth can employ common sense, center disease control compliant safety measures to reopen. This is about doing the right thing. And we live in a great commonwealth with smart, innovative people who can safely reopen for business. Hardest hit among these suffering during this economic shutdown are single parent families and independent business owners. I'm hearing from many independent business owners of a distressing time they're going through, still unable to apply for unemployment, many of whom have not, have not received any income in over a month. This is unconscionable. It's time for good common sense measures to be implemented. So indeed, this is not an either or proposition. We can, with the provisions in Senate Bill 613, allow businesses to reopen without threatening the health of our population. We need to hear the voice of our people. We need to be the voice of the people. I've studied extensively the guidelines from a national strategic perspective as laid out by the Center of Disease Control and Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which clearly delineates and outlines how we can safely and smartly reopen key sector, sectors of our state without compromising the integrity of our population. This is indeed the time for action, not for dithering and inaction. I urge all my colleagues to do the right thing, to not be deaf to the needs and cries of our people. Senate Bill 613 will not threaten anyone's life. It is a safe, informed, and proven way to get back to work without increasing the spread of the virus. The massive shutdown order is having a far-reaching impact that is undercutting every sector of our state, and I fear our lives. For instance, the unnecessary mandate to shut down car dealers across the state, except those lucky enough to get a waiver, is keeping essential personnel from getting their, to their jobs. A personal friend of ours is a nurse. She's on the front line of freedom here fighting the good fight and her car broke down, is not repairable, and she's having a heck of a time getting to where she needs to be to help our people. That's just one vignette of many that I'm hearing. This is why I'm concerned about this one-size-fits-all shutdown order. We also know the impact it's having on dairy farmers, especially in my district, who are forced to dump their products in the midst of this crisis here because they can't put, put it in containers or get it to the shops in time. There's too much friction caused by the shutdown order. And then the waiver process, which I alluded to already, has proven inconsistent and flawed throughout its existence. It's time to stand up for our people, to be their voice, to safely open up sectors of the state. As a historian, I look across the centuries of our great commonwealth, and I see the many crises we've come out better and stronger. The French and Indian War, the Revolution, the Civil War, which devastated my district in 1863, the First World War, the Great Depression, the Second World War, the Cold War, and of course, 9-11. Yet, 
I fear the ill-advised decisions closing vast swaths of our economy will make the consequences of this pandemic far, far worse than it needs being. I agree with my esteemed colleague from York County that all jobs are essential. All jobs are life-sustaining. I urge my colleagues to do the right thing, to look out for our people, to not be deaf to their cries, and vote to support Senate Bill 613. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Lindsey Williams. Thank you, Mr. President. We are living in a new world today than we were living at the beginning of the year. We are in the middle of a global pandemic. The impact of that has been extremely painful. We have lost at least 647 Pennsylvanians to COVID-19. More than 26,490 of our neighbors have been sickened with more than 2,369 of those neighbors needing hospitalization. We went from historic low unemployment to historic high unemployment in a matter of days. The Department of Labor received more than 1.3 million initial unemployment claims in the last few weeks. I want to thank those state employees who are working 10 hour shifts, seven days a week, trying to get benefits to those who desperately need it. The unemployment office was understaffed before this happened and the system wasn't designed for this volume. Secretary Alexiak is bringing on more staff as quickly as possible I know that isn't much help to the people who need their unemployment benefits to pay their bills right now, but I want you to know that our state employees really do care about you and they're doing the best they can to get you your check. I have also been getting many calls, emails, texts, Facebook messages from small business owners that are struggling. We do have to address this problem, but simply allowing nearly every business to reopen is not the solution. We will need federal and state stimulus dollars to help these businesses stay afloat. Many of the complaints I've received are centered around the waiver process. They're wondering why one business similar to theirs is allowed to be open while theirs is not. Their complaints are fair and I have been equally frustrated with the opaque process. I'm trying to be sensitive to the fact that we are basically building a plane while we're flying it. But that doesn't mean that the government's actions don't have consequences. In uncertain times like these, we need to be more transparent than ever. The small businesses that are making tremendous sacrifices to do the right thing have to know that the rules they are following are the same for everyone. I sent a letter to DCED Secretary Davin in March stating that the process for obtaining a waiver should be clearly defined, uniformly applied, and transparent. And I stand by that. But while I know that the process has been far from perfect, Senate Bill 613 is not the answer. The answer is not to open up almost all businesses right now. Despite what those in favor of this legislation say, the guidelines it refers to read closely enough would open up a range of businesses across Pennsylvania that will put our collective public health at risk. We can deal with the econ economic impacts of these painful mitigation efforts, but we cannot bring people back from the dead. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency size a memo that SB 613 mandates the governor follow says in bold letters, this list is advisory in nature. This is not, nor should it be, considered a federal directive or standard. Additionally, this advisory list is not intended to be the exclusive list of critical infrastructure sectors, workers, and functions that should continue during COVID-19 response across all jurisdictions. Individual jurisdictions should add or subtract essential workforce categories based on their own requirements and discretion. It makes zero sense to mandate that the governor follow a list that they specifically say is not meant to be followed like that. We are talking about how we believe these mitigation efforts are working. We're seeing a little bit of that evidence. That doesn't mean we stop because some politicians say so. We need to transition out of these closures in consultation with medical experts and based on scientific data. The experts are opposed to this legislation. The fact of the matter is we still do not have the testing capacity to determine what we need to do. We need way more tests across the Commonwealth. Some of my colleagues have talked about 
how if a business follows the CDC guidelines, they will be allowed to open and work if they want to work under Senate Bill 613. The part that they leave out is that there is literally no enforcement of these guidelines. There is no penalty for employers who do not file, follow these guidelines. There are no meaningful protections for workers who speak up about violations of these CDC guidelines. There are some employers that are doing the best they can to protect workers. However, I have heard from countless workers that their employers are not even doing the bare minimum. I have spoke to workers who are in tears about the conditions at their employment. They are afraid to go to work, but they can't afford to stay home. They are sick and don't have access to a test, but they don't have paid sick days. They are afraid to speak up about their concern because they're afraid to lose their jobs. That fear is not unjustified. I had an employer, Aramark, in my district fire two employees on Monday who had a doctor's note to self-quarantine due to the danger of possible exposure to COVID-19. That's unacceptable. Senator Costa offered an omnibus amendment in rules that would have provided workers with paid sick days, access to proper PPE, strong anti-retaliation protections for workers who speak up, and civil penalties for employers who don't protect their workers. This amendment failed in committee. We cannot widely open business if we don't protect workers. If we don't take precautions, more workers will get sick, more workers will die, and that will absolutely negatively affect our businesses. Our businesses cannot run without workers. We have to be honest with Pennsylvanians. We do not have adequate PPE for the people that are working right now. We have nurses that are reusing masks, we have home health care workers and first responders that still don't have masks or hand sanitizer. We have grocery store workers, bus drivers, letter carriers, and many, many other frontline workers that lack adequate PPE. And those workers are getting sick and some of those workers are dying. Broadly opening businesses without having PPE, PPE in place will literally cost lives. We need to work with Governor Wolf, Secretary Levine, and medical experts to develop a plan to safely reopen business. If Senate Bill 613 did that, I would vote for it, but it doesn't do that. Therefore, I'm a no vote, and I ask my colleagues to also vote no. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Kim Ward. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, Senator, you, uh, you are speaking on the floor. Okay, I um, thank you very much, Mr. President. I had waved off because of much of what I was going to say has already been said over and over, so it'd be quite repetitive. Um, but I will add, we would love to work with the governor and the administration on reopening businesses, but they don't work with us. And he has he announced uh, a couple of days ago, they're going to work instead with governors from other Northeastern states. I think if we had been involved at some level, at some point, we wouldn't be in this position right now. Because as has been said over and over, you know, the waiver process has been really almost disastrous. I know the folks are working as hard as they can uh, to, to get through those waivers, but the fact is we can't find out who is making those decisions, what they're basing those decisions on. There has been, zero transparency as we try to work with the administration. And that has been very, very much of the frustration. There are many, many sectors of our economy that could go back to work and go back to work safely using the coronavirus protocol, but we don't really have input into what any of those are. This state of emergency has taken away our three equal branches of government that we are supposed to uh, be living under. So I'm not going to go on and on and repeat everything that's already been said, but I do think we need transparency, we need accountability, and we need to be involved because while we are working and we are collecting a paycheck, while many of, uh, of our other uh, constituents are working, and well, thank God, the first responders and the front lines are working, many, 
many people that we represent are not working. They are not able to collect their checks. It's been weeks. That is the, the question that we get constantly in the office and we try our best to help. And I know that the folks in labor and industry are doing their best. They were not prepared for this because there was no preparation for 1.3 million applicants in, in a month when we had a total of 750,000 last year. I just had a message just shortly ago from a, a constituent saying that he hasn't been paid in three weeks. He was deemed non-essential, even though if you look at the supply chain, he should have been deemed essential and he can't pay his child support. And when you can't pay your child support, not only does the child suffer, you're not going to get your, uh, your stimulus check. So it is a, a very, very big ball of trouble where we are um, experiencing right now. And anything we can do to help get people off of those unemployment rolls while also keeping their health safe, we should be doing. So thank you very much, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and I appreciate um, this, this opportunity um, uh, to speak on the matter. And um, as was listening to everyone, um, I've jotted down lots of notes, um, and I'll do my best um, uh, not to be uh, uh, repetitive. A number of things come to mind. Uh, I want to. I think it's important that we see this in context. Uh, and we see this issue um, also um, from a vantage point that, for example, Senator Schwank provided us. Senator Schwank uh, talked about a person that in her district who says, yeah, I'd like things to open up, but we need to be real careful about that because um, if things start to open up again, I can't be sure that I'll be able to protect my family when I go home from work. Um, because uh, the necessary equipment is not available. The necessary PPEs, the necessary masks, the necessary uh, protective equipment, um, all the things that are needed in this pandemic uh, that we're involved in. Senator Muth talked about the fact that we can bring an economy back, but we can't bring a life back. You know, we need to be very careful uh, in not rushing um, and being thoughtful about what it is that we're trying to get done with respect to bringing our economy back. But paramount, number one, first and foremost, is protecting the health of the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the health of the people of this nation. That's our number one job. That's our number one responsibility. We can bring an economy back. We can put people back to work. We cannot bring a life back. Context is important. Transparency. So many folks talk about transparency. Well, you know what? In this issue, transparency starts at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's where transparency starts. Transparency starts at why this whole thing was ignored years ago when it should have been addressed on the front end. That's what's put us there. If you want transparency out of uh, uh, the governor's office, you damn sure better be at, prepared to ask for transparency out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and the person who occupies the White House right now. You have outrage there with the governor, you should have that same kind of outrage at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. You want to adhere to the CDC guidelines? Well, why don't we demand that the person occupying the White House adheres to CDC guidelines there. We want masks and PPEs for all of our frontline workers. We give them false platitudes if we ignore their one request. Their one request is to stay at home. Frontline workers, healthcare workers, their one request is to keep everybody at home. So don't say that they're heroes 
and then ignore their one simple request. Stay home. We want masks. We want people to come to work. We want people to, to revitalize the economy. We want people out engaged and, and, and spending what few dollars uh, th that, that they may have. But if we don't have the, the, the PPEs, if we don't have the masks, if we don't have the testing available to all of Pennsylvania citizens so that people can fully and safely engage, uh, then what are we sending people actually to do? We're putting them in harm's way. But then the next question is, why don't we have that equipment? Why don't we have the masks? Why don't we have the PPEs? Why don't we have the testing? Well, start at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue with the person occupying the White House. And why have they shut down? Why have they taken negotiated deals away from Pennsylvania and other states and taken that information, taking taking that equipment right from underneath ours? and put it somewhere else. You want transparency? Ask that question. You have outrage, that's where your outrage should be addressed. That's where your outrage should be focused. So if we can't get the, the, uh, the equipment to keep ourselves safe, if we can't create an environment where everyone understands that it's about saving lives first and then restoring the economy, if we can't deal with the issue of transparency 24 seven across the board at every level and have that same outrage at every level. If we can't make sure that if we put people back to work, that they have the safe equipment, that they go to a workplace that is safe and secure, washed down and, 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 and disinfected and cleaned appropriately. If we can't have safe environments for people to go to work in, then we're just sending them back to a situation where this disease will only continue even more. Only more people will die. Only more, the economy will be much more devastated than it is right now. Mr. President, this is, this is a, this is a no vote because, the, because what has been offered up here, what has been offered up here in an environment where as I think Senator Williams indicated, we're putting this thing together. We're putting the parts of the plane together while we're flying it. And that's a very difficult thing. We should respect the difficulty that exists for everyone as we put this process together. But until we get all of the equipment, until we understand most importantly that human lives have to be put first before we rebuild the economy, can't just willy-nilly go down this process and start opening things up without having everything in order. President, I'm a no vote, would encourage the same. And again, let's not offer false platitudes. Let's not offer false platitudes to healthcare workers and say that they're heroes, but then don't listen to what this simple request is to stay at home. And to the, the gentleman who's a historian, Who's, who's studied pandemics, maybe the person at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue should have listened to you. Study pandemics. Maybe, 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 maybe. <laughs> Said that the Soviets hadn't been involved in this. Question that assertion. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Judy Ward. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to express my strong support for Senate Bill 613. I too am a nurse, and I know what we have done has been incredibly helpful to flatten that curve, but my constituents as well as my business owners have spoken loud and clear. They know that they can return to work in a safe manner using CDC recommendations and guidelines. They understand that life and business will be different. The majority of my legislative district has little COVID-19. Hospitals in my district are actually laying people off 
as we speak. The fact is we currently have no plan. No plan has been offered to us. Why would we allow state bureaucrats or other governors to decide our economic destiny? The provisions in the bill would expand the list of businesses that can work safely, just like our neighboring states. This is not and should not be political. It should not be political. A builder who works by himself in my district, building homes, has been building a home for a family that lost everything in a tragic fire. He has applied twice for a waiver and has been denied. This is insanity. As my colleague from Lancaster County said very eloquently, the health of our community and the health of our economy are not mutually exclusive. I ask for a positive vote for Senate Bill 613. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, Senator Street. Mr. President, uh, I uh, rise uh, to oppose this measure. Um, many have talked about the profits uh, that we've lost. Um, the fact that our businesses aren't doing well, and sure, we all want a strong economy. But there's a scripture, I believe in Mark chapter eight, it's written, what profit of a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his soul or his self? We're fighting for the souls of individual Pennsylvanians. We're fighting for people's lives. The Declaration of Independence reads, and we hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident meaning that they shouldn't require explanation. The chief amongst them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People's lives are at stake. This is not a game and our economy uh, will come back, but the people who lose their lives will not. Medical experts have all suggested that it is too early uh, to begin to a massive reopening of the economy and letting all of businesses return to work. We simply don't have the protective equipment necessary for that and adding non-essential personnel who would need per personal protective equipment to the uh, to pulling for, to the pool of people pulling it away from our essential personnel puts nurses lives at risk put doctors lives at risk put police officers lives at risk put grocery workers lives at risk put transit workers lives at risk many of whom already cannot get adequate personal protective equipment um, we, by reopening the economy prematurely when, biz, when we don't have adequate testing, um, so we don't really know who has uh, COVID-19. We don't know who is infected and who is healthy, and we know that a number of people will be infected and not manifest symptoms, but those people can still infect other people with a disease that will kill them. We don't know, not because Governor Wolf or Secretary Levine failed to come up with testing. We don't know because the President of the United States failed to uh, make sure we had adequate testing. He failed to act quickly. He failed to make sure we had adequate uh, 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 tracing systems. He failed to make sure we had adequate testing system, um, uh, health, health care uh, ventilators and other things that were needed. And because of those failures, Governor Wolf and other governors around the Commonwealth did what was necessary to protect human life. And they did what was necessary to make sure our healthcare system wasn't overwhelmed. And yes, it is unfortunate that so many people are out of work. And it is so, it is unfortunate about that we've had the negative consequences to our economy. But we are where we are. And at this point, it would be irresponsible for us to put lives at jeopardy by, re by massively reopening the economy in a manner inconsistent with, uh, uh, with what our healthcare experts, Dr. Levine is a medical doctor. She has taken the appropriate steps 
to look at what's going on and to make recommendations tailored for Pennsylvania. The federal government itself that people want us to refer to has said that it is its edicts and its directives should not be used as guidance to determine whether states should reopen, but in fact, that guidance should come from individual governors. The, the reality is that we, that the coordination that we're seeing across state lines by the governor is because he's trying to create, he's trying to make sure that we don't have disease uh, track from, from state to state. That coordination is incredibly essential, but can only be maintained if the governor has the authority to, to make decisions as to what opens and reopens and doesn't open. Now, sure, every process can be improved, but the reality is irresponsibly opening the economy uh, before we're ready could have dire consequences to our health. And those consequences to our health ultimately will set us back further. Even our experts in Wall Street have suggested that the economic return, an economic return and an economic recovery must follow a health recovery. We must be prepared to have our, our, gov our, our, our government be prepared to provide for the health needs of people. A collapse of our healthcare system would only result in further economic losses and a redoubling of our efforts to have to shut down the, the, the economy once again. I understand that members of this chamber want people to work and want people to prosper economically, and we all do. I understand that people are frustrated that people are at home that want to go out and work. I understand that we have people who simply want to go back to life as normal. None of us asked for this disease. And as, and as members of state government, there is only so much we can do. But I applaud Governor Wolf for taking the steps that were needed and making hard decisions when people in Washington, the President of the United States, could not. And I ask my colleagues to bear with this process and not act so rashly that we reopen the economy in mass only to have it close again, that we try in our pursuit of profits for people's businesses, we call, we cause people to lose their lives. I remind members that while it may seem like we have the whole world to gain, what profit did a man, what profit did the Commonwealth gain the whole world, but we lose the lives of those we love? How many of us would trade the life of a loved one who is older, who is vulnerable, who has asthma, who may have immune deficiencies? How many of us would trade that person's life for a stronger economy? I certainly would not. I, and I suggest to us that in a state that has the second oldest, po one of the oldest populations, if not, I think some statistics said the second oldest population in America, which means we have a significant portion of our population that are vulnerable, that we not subject all of those citizens to massive spread of disease that we don't know where it is, we don't yet have the tests. We don't yet have the tracing. Our healthcare system isn't ready. The time to reopen the economy is not now. And we should not ignore the callings of our healthcare professionals. We should honor their requests. We should support the governor. We should vote no on Senate Bill 613. And we should remember that we have to put people before profits. And it, does us no good to gain profit and lose ourselves. No vote on this legislation. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Lisa Baker. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we all recognize that extraordinary steps needed to be taken to reduce the spread of the devastating coronavirus. Healthcare judgments have been driving policy, and that is to the credit of everyone. And thankfully, those restrictions are having a positive effect on flattening the curve, as the healthcare experts put it. Still, the number of serious cases and the rising death total attributable to the virus are beyond heartbreaking for those affected. 
decision making is never more difficult when answers are lacking and risk is everywhere. And at the same time, the limitations we are living with are impacting other health and safety threats. These range from a rise in abuse to drop off in health maintenance and preventative care, all situations complicated by added stress levels that many people are suffering due to the declining economic circumstances. Every day I hear worries about lack of funding, lack of money to meet individuals' basic needs. And during my constant conversations with families, workers, employers in every part of my district, there have been many questions raised about the extent of the state declared business shutdown and the mysterious process for deciding who can reopen and who cannot. I can't tell you the number of constituents who've said, why isn't the General Assembly a true check and balance in this process? Why aren't we involved? How can a business in my district apply two times under the waiver process because they didn't hear from the first one and be given two separate answers in the same week? How can the Pennsylvania State Police be constructing a new headquarters in Northeastern Pennsylvania when a township in my Senate district isn't permitted to continue finishing a new fire station? An inherent difficulty in statewide emergency mandates is that 67 counties are very different in makeup, perspective, and priority. In reality, that is too familiar to many of us, rural counties in normal times are at a disadvantage in so many ways. I've worked continually with workers, employers, local leaders and organizations as we tried to create opportunity. And as the last recession brought home, rural counties recover um, and are hardest hit in an economic emergency situation. They're slower to recover than some of our more populous areas. And now the engine is thrown in reverse again and the fear of free fall is all around. So here's the hard truth we must confront. Can the rest of the state afford to wait for clearance until certain areas are ready to reopen? In response to such concerns, I believe we have crafted and advanced legislation that will put primary responsibility for decisions on reopening at the county level, not with governors in states far away, putting discretion and decision-making power in county courthouses in the hands of local officials who are closest to the people. This is not a mere exchange of mandates Rather, it allows greater discretion than the state has been willing to grant. There is suitable consultation and notice required, which is more than the state has shown. And from my vantage point, I must say, this is not meant as an indictment of the intentions of the governor or of our secretary of health, nor is it re-arguing the lines of authority. They acted when required executive leadership and example, and respect is certainly due for that role and what they have done. However, the manner in which some decisions have been executed and implemented is regrettably, as you have heard, unbalanced, inconsistent, and secretive. Unbalanced, inconsistent, and secretive. That is what we aim to remedy. We shuttered small businesses on Main Street while keeping open large facilities where the risk is even greater. You can look at the impacts here in Luzerne County from some of those deemed essential businesses operating in large facilities. We've all received communications charging that profits are being put ahead of lives. I have no interest in doing that. 
in this monumental fear and uncertainty, certainly those concerns are understandable. But that conclusion is truly incorrect. This measure is about giving people the chance to go back to work where there is an opportunity to do so safely and reasonably. Safely and reasonably. If we await, Pennsylvania may not have an economy left to sustain us going forward safely and reasonably. As you heard, the unemployment numbers are beyond belief and our system is buckling in providing these benefits and more will continue to apply. So this legislation is not a setback to the health first approach that we have in place. It is a hard realization that things have gone too far in various ways in various places, such as construction. In saving lives, we simply cannot destroy the future hopes of those communities in which we live, work, and raise our families. So I too urge an affirmative vote. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Costa. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to express my opposition to Senate Bill 613. And along with the nearly dozen of members of this side of the aisle who did so as well. As a gentlelady from York mentioned, we are in unprecedented times. As we take to the floor here today, utilizing technology that we have not, not thought of before. The way in which we live our lives separated from each other, limited in our travel and shopping activities, things are different. Mr. President, all these adjustments to our lifestyle, all these adjustments have been made for a purpose. They've been recommended, recommended to us by health professionals for a particular purpose, and that is to flatten the curve and stop the spread of, of the COVID-19 virus. March 23rd, Governor Wolf made the difficult decision to close non-essential businesses. And at the time, we had less than 1,000 cases, but we were increasing those cases at a rate of about 34% every day. On April 1st, he issued the statewide stay-at-home order, and our rates were dropping to 20% each day over day. And within two weeks of the non-essential business closures and all of us staying at home, our rate dropped to a daily increase of about 7%. I give you those numbers because our efforts, our purpose with respect to these accommodations is working and it's working fine. Have we not done any of these mitigation efforts that Dr. Rachel Levine talks about so frequently day in and day out? Things like social distancing measures, washing our hands for 20 seconds, the testing that needs to be done, we would have seen an increase at a rate of 34%, which would have left us with nearly a half a million Pennsylvanians who would have been sick with the COVID virus. But now instead, today we have 26,000 folks who have been impacted and roughly a significant number of deaths. It's clear these mitigation efforts have been advised, as I mentioned, by healthcare professionals, and they've been issued thoughtfully. That's what's important here. And as I mentioned earlier, they've been effective in helping us deal with the spread of this virus. This virus is highly contagious, and it's a deadly virus, and it was spreading faster than any of us had ever seen before. And with limited testing available through this process, and still no vaccine, and now knowing that spreads, that this virus spreads without, seeking, without symptoms, we had to take diffi make difficult decisions. And that's precisely what our governor and our health secretary did. But again, I repeat, those decisions are working. We are bending the curve. We are flattening the curve, as we've heard so much about from federal health officials and state health officials. And we are saving lives. You know, every person that spoke here today, and I think all of our colleagues in this chamber, know it was a hard decision, and we understand the difficulty Governor Wolf and the decision he had to make with respect to closing non-essential businesses. No one in this chamber, as I mentioned earlier in remarks, 
wants to do that. We don't want to harm our business community, particularly the strong and diverse small businesses that we have here in Pennsylvania to really make, make up a significant part of our economy, but make us the great commonwealth that we live in and work in. But saving lives during this pandemic and flattening the exposure and the spread of this virus were essential. That effort has been led in a very remarkable fashion, in my view, by our Secretary of the Department of Health, Dr. Rachel Levine, who has provided to each of us and to the constituents of Pennsylvania, the residents of our Commonwealth, daily updates about our collective fight, our collective fight against COVID-19. And as we know and we all recognize and understand that this fight has come with sacrifices, and I know, I know that our business community is feeling them deeply. But the most important thing at this point in time is our health. We have carried the concerns of our business community. As someone residing in Allegheny County and representing a large part of the city of Pittsburgh, I clearly understand the impact it's had on our business community and the third largest center with respect to the second and third largest economic centers in this Commonwealth. Here in Harrisburg, we have already begun to do our work on creating our statewide stimulus package and a loan package to help those businesses, help them recover financially. But again, as many of my colleagues have stated, it is not time to reopen Pennsylvania businesses broadly. And that's what Senate Bill 613 does, unfortunately. It is not yet safe, and every recommendation that we have gotten from experts ask us not to do this. Dr. Levine has asked us not to support and open up the businesses. And I will introduce Dr. Levine's letter that came today for the record. But I want to point out two parts to that, two sentences that, out of this lengthy letter to all of us. I write today to alert you about the devastating impact Senate Bill 613, printer number 1636, or any other measure which would dilute the effectiveness of the statewide mitigation efforts and what they would have on the public health of Pennsylvanians. The devastating impact. Further in her letter, she talks about encouraging increased social movement of Pennsylvanians at this time by reopening a significant amount of the businesses would be reckless and irresponsible. Reckless and irresponsible. We have heard from health care, home health care workers who've asked us not to support this measure. We have heard from the Pennsylvania State Association of, State, of Staff Nurses and Professionals who also tell us not to support this measure. Dr. Levine, health expert, but the folks at the front line, this letter too I would ask be admitted into the record for all of us to understand what was stated. Frontline workers, workers all across different trades and in different industries have asked us not to pass Senate Bill 613. And all the experts on the front line, some of whom I mentioned, front line of this crisis have asked us not to pass this legislation. They indicate to us, to each of us, they'd still, we still do not have a handle on this epidemic. This week is projected to be one of the deadliest that we see in our Commonwealth and certainly in our country as well. And still with just only one-tenth of one percent of Pennsylvanians have been tested, we are not where we need to be with respect to opening businesses. But I ask the question, why? after we say all the wonderful things about the frontline workers who are helping fight this epidemic, this pandemic, why are we disregarding their voices today? Why are we saying to them, we think we like what you're doing, we thank you for what we're doing, but your opinion doesn't matter. What matters is the opinion of the local county commissioner or the county executive who's gonna decide whether or not we should be opening our businesses in our Commonwealth. Mr. President, when we have a better handle, a better handle on the testing, as I mentioned, 
and our health experts agree that we can safely begin restarting our economy, phasing in our economy, then and only then why not stand in the way of legislation that could assist to do that. And our caucus will not stand in the way of that as well. But passing Senate Bill 613 right now, has been indicated by my colleagues, is, is a danger to every Pennsylvania, every Pennsylvanian, and as Dr. Levine said, it is reckless and irresponsible. Through this process, Mr. President, workers will undoubtedly get sick, customers will get sick, and the virus will spread to their families, and we will lose progress. All the progress that we have made over the course of the past four and a half or five weeks with respect to the sacrifices that have been made by so many in this Commonwealth who are adhering to the stay-at-home orders. Mr. President, we're all frustrated, and certainly living with social distancing and not being able to work is not ideal. And I understand, I understand and hear the concerns from our business community in particular, but there are things that we should be doing that we haven't been doing with respect to moving our businesses back into compliance to be able to make certain that we'll be able to open businesses up here in Pennsylvania. Productive things that allow us the opportunity to protect our frontline workers and protect the workers who will be now called upon to go to work and making certain that we have provisions in place to protect those men and women who are forced to go back to work when they feel they shouldn't be able to do that. And to think that all of our businesses who are going to be freed up under this legislation to conduct their businesses will have the opportunity to follow the CDC requirements, I think is foolish to think that they're going to do that. I've, and there are a lot of good businesses that are doing it right now, but at the end of the day, we know, and each of us, at least I know in my heart, as much as I would love to see them all follow it, I don't see it happening, and it puts people and it puts workers at risk. And Mr. President, over the past month, we have worked, I believe, in a very positive bipartisan fashion. We've made changes to our election law to move the primary. We made changes to our requirements for unemployment compensation for individuals, eliminating the first week requirement, allowing them to collect from day one, and not impacting our business with rate increases, and looking at the work search requirement and no longer be available. We developed a program through DCED to provide loans to small businesses, and we've also allowed our public education throughout our Commonwealth to continue via distance learning. We've had the opportunity to continue to work in that fashion. But this bill, 613, and Senate Bill 327 that's going to follow, does not do what needs to be done in this Commonwealth. As we saw yesterday, we certainly heard from so many folks who said they're opposed to this legislation. I referenced some of them in my remarks. But not a single Democrat in the House of, Representative, House of Representatives supported this measure. Nor do I expect that we'll have any Democratic votes on this side. Mr. President, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of many of my colleagues, Senate Bill 613 is an effort to take away the authority, take it away from our Governor, Tom Wolf, and Secretary Rachel Levine, who has been leading our collective fight against this epidemic. Mr. President, in fact, just yesterday, last evening, I was watching our President speak on the White House lawn. And probably the most important thing that I heard him say was that the states should not be pressured by anyone and by the president to open up their commonwealth, open up their economies. Those decisions, he said, should be left, should be left with the governors, the governors of those states to make those determinations. And that's what we believe should be the case here as well. Democrats believe that Governor Tom Wolf, upon the advice of his health secretary, Dr. Rachel Levine, should be continuing to guide us in a successful effort to mitigate and to do more testing and to ensure that we have the proper PPE in place for our frontline workers, particularly at our hospital facilities. Mr. President, governors across this country, including those in the southeast or northeast part of the state that we've heard so much about today, they're all looking for one thing. And I think the people of Pennsylvania are looking for one thing. They're looking for expert guidance. They're looking for informed indicators about what we need to do. And as we move forward as an economy, 
what those things need to be to allow us to get ourselves back to some level of normalcy. normalcy. In other states, folks are beginning and proposing that we look at indicators which would tell us when it's appropriate for us to go back and restart and phase in our economy. They're looking for indicators that will show us and tell us that we have the ability to monitor and protect our communities through testing, contact testing, tra contract taste tracing, isolating and supporting those individuals who have tested positive or have been exposed to the COVID-19 virus. Indicators that demonstrate that we have the ability to prevent infection in people who are at high risk for, and also those who are at high risk for more severe degrees of COVID-19. Indicators that tell us that our hospitals and our health care systems have the capacity and the PPE to be able to handle the surges that will be coming across Pennsylvania. And they will be coming. As I indicated, we're looking at probably the first this week being one of the worst on record. Indicators that tell us that we have the ability to develop therapeutics to meet the demand that will be forthcoming. And the ability of our schools and our businesses and our child care facilities to support physical distance, distancing and the ability to determine, if necessary, to determine when and if necessary to reinstitute certain measures such as stay-at-home orders which have become effective. Mr. President, these are good indicators, but we aren't there yet. Our hospitals and our health systems have had, still have a, a, a critical need for the PPE that we've talked about. They will continue to be strained, and as we go forward, well, that strain will only get worse. We don't have widespread testing, as I asked for and mentioned, as an indicator. We do not have a vaccine or a way to stop the spread to folks who, as I mentioned, are at high risk. And the list of businesses provided by the federal government through Senate Bill 613 references are explicitly, explicitly, as was mentioned by my colleagues, not federal standards or guidelines or expectation. In fact, as was mentioned earlier, and I mentioned in my remarks regarding the amendments that were being offered, the list was advisory in nature, and at the end of the day, look to, they look to the, and recommend that you look to the individual jurisdictions who may want to add or subtract the central workforce categories based on their own requirements and discretion. That's what this is about. We've given the governor, and the law gives the governor discretion to do the things that he wants to be able to do. And I would remind folks that our Supreme Court upheld our governor's ability to be able to make these decisions and make these calls. That's what this recommendation says as well. That's what our governor has been doing, exercising that discretion along and with the advice of Dr. Rachel Levine, our Secretary of Health. We are about to vote on the bill based on a vague list from the federal government that health experts have warned us against. We should not be doing this. It is reckless and it's irresponsible. What we'd like to see us take up and talk about are many of the measures that were contained in the amendment that I offered in the Rules Committee, working and standing with our frontline workers to keep them safe and keep them safe at this dangerous time and that this legislation passes at a time when things will get worse for them. Providing health care, unemployment, and workers' compensation benefits to keep working families, working families who have been impacted by COVID-19 to help keep them afloat. Those are the conversations that we should be having along those lines. And we should continue to work to provide small businesses as a commonwealth in conjunction with what was done at the federal level, financial assistance so they could keep their employees, and when the time is right for them to open and allow that to be able to open, them to be able to open, that we have the opportunity to allow them to do that in a fluid way. Mr. President, these are bills that Senate Democrats have introduced and are seeking action and seeking co-sponsors on as we speak. And we're hopeful that we'll be able to talk about those in the weeks to come. And I do appreciate the gentleman's uh, comments earlier, the Majority Leader's comments, that there are some things that have merit in that conversation. We look forward to that discussion. But Mr. President, let's protect workers. Let's protect workers and their families. Instead of rushing to open up workplaces 
that are deemed to be ill-advised at this point in time. We can emerge, we can emerge from this crisis with both a financially and medically healthy population if we do so by working together. And we listen to the doctors and we listen to our health experts. They will help us path, create a path. They will help us create a plan for a safe recovery through this process. Mr. President, at the end of the day, our constituents want us to lead, but they also want all of us collectively to be led, to be led by the folks that know Pennsylvania best. Those are our health experts. They know what's the best interest of the health of this Commonwealth, and they've been exercising it for the past four weeks. My hope is that they will be continued to give the, be given the opportunity to be able to continue to do that. They want to hear from doctors. They want to hear from nurses. And they want to hear from public health professionals. And they hope that their voices will be heard, not rejected like they're being rejected today. They want opinions, and our people want opinions of the frontline workers. And they're looking to be led by science, medicine, and evidence, not by partisan legislation, and not by politicians, both at the local or state level. That's not what they want. They want to be led in an appropriate way. I'd ask for a negative vote on Senate Bill 613. Thank you, Mr. President. And before I conclude, I'd like to introduce these two letters into the record, one on behalf of Dr. Rachel Levine and the other one, the other one from the Pennsylvania Association of Staff Nurses and Ally Professionals. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. You, the letters will be submitted for the record. Uh, further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, I spoke a lot during the Rules Committee, so I won't speak uh, that long here today. Uh, but just uh, want to make a couple comments. Um, first of all, I don't know that I can think of an issue or last time we had an issue that drew so many speakers. It shows you the importance of what we're dealing with. We're all dealing with this pandemic, this emergency. Uh, so there's a great desire as legislators to be involved uh, in crafting public policy uh, to, uh, to help with this crisis. And I commend all the, the people who have spoken today and, and it's been a very uh, worthwhile debate. A um, couple of things that you know, I think we can all agree on. Uh, first of all, you know, during this pandemic, there are businesses that need to stay open. I mean, I didn't make that decision. Uh, no one in this chamber made that decision. Um, the governor made that decision uh, by his executive order allowing, um, despite the shutdown of the Commonwealth and stay-at-home order, allowing essential business, life-sustaining business to stay open. So that, that's not an argument whether some businesses should be open or not. That's, the governor made that decision. I don't know that anyone has disagreed that some uh, businesses uh, should stay open during this pandemic and during this state of emergency. And it seems like, and I don't want to speak for all 50 members, but just listening to the speech here today, uh, there's at least a bipartisan nature that everyone's frustrated, or not everyone at least, but bipartisan way, uh, members of the legislature are frustrated with the current process of which the governor's determined what is life-sustaining, what is essential, and what is not essential. Uh, I've heard that from both sides, that they're very frustrated with the process, and, and that you know it's been difficult for all of us as dealing with our constituent requests, uh, how to you know, how to, how, to, how to comply with what the, the governor is requesting uh, and the governor's standards that, that he has set out there. And so the question before us is whether we continue or allow this to continue uh, through the governor's process that uh, has driven such uh, frustration, uh, that has not been transparent, that, that has uh, been uneven across the Commonwealth, or do we come up with another system as legislators, that's our right as public policymakers. Certainly the governor's had the powers and no one's again questioning his authority, uh, but we as legislators can legislate as well to try to develop a system that we think works better for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, and so, you know, we came up with this bill uh, that would, again, adopt CDC and CISA standards uh, for what is essential, what is non-essential. Again, it's not, not us deciding this, not us picking winners and losers. We want this business open. We don't care about this business. Let's, let's go to a nationally recognized standard a nationally recognized standard that can determine what is essential, what is not essential. Get away from this waiver process. And look, I'm as guilty as the next on this because I think I'm the one who suggested to the governor he should allow for waivers. And I guess it's one of those things, be careful what you wish for because uh, it's turned out to, to be uh, just a, a real problem and, 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 and a real sore spot for everyone who's tried to circumvent, circumvent uh, the process or deal with the process. Uh, so, you know, this seems to be, for us, a scientific way to determine what is essential and non-essential. Now, 
you know, I've heard on a variety of, of, during this debate of a massive reopening of, of, uh, of businesses. That's not what this is. This is not a massive reopening of businesses. This is still a very select amount of businesses uh, that the CDC and, and the Department of Homeland Security through the CISA standards has determined as to be essential. Now, the governor initially adopted these standards. When he first put his first order out, he adopted these standards. Uh, and then, as was his right, and no one's questioning that, he has deviated from that and got us into this morass where people can't figure out why this business is open and this business is not. And so, you know, again, this bill would take some of that unclear process away and bring clarity to what scientists of the CDC and scientists, uh, I assume there's some scientists at the Department of Homeland Security, have developed as recommendations to us to follow. Now, I, I, I hear the minority leader, uh, my good friend and colleague, talk about what the Dr. Levine has suggested. And look, um, she's done a marvelous job, the, the doctor's done a marvelous job through this process, and, and a very difficult process that no one probably, when they signed out to be the Secretary of the Department of Health, ever envisioned they'd be going through. But when you refer to this bill as reckless and irresponsible, I can only take that you are referring to the people of the CDC and Department of Homeland Security system standards as reckless and irresponsible. When we're adopting their recommendations, we're adopting their recommendations in this bill, that people are referring to them at the CDC as reckless and irresponsible. Now, it was suggested earlier that CDC is saying not to open up the economy, and we're not. We are not doing that here today. We're not going any further than what they have recommended. This bill doesn't go any further than what the CDC and Department of Homeland Security have recommended. That's it. No further than that. And so when people suggest that, that it is it's profits before people, I guess they're suggesting that the recommendations from the CDC and Department of Homeland Security are profit before people. Because that's all we're doing is adopting those recommendations. I don't think that's a fair characterization of the people of the CDC who are working very hard during this pandemic. I don't think it's a fair characterization of the people of uh, Department of Homeland Security who developed the CISA standards. I think they put out what they believe is the best. Now again, we, the governor has the power and it has shown it to deviate from that, and he has. And he has the power to, to try to make it the best way he thinks he can. We've all lived it, we've all decided that has been a disaster. That has been unfair, it's not been transparent. Let's come up with a better way. And adopting these standards scientifically put together, in our mind, it was the best way to move forward not just sort of picking out who we think should be uh, open, who shouldn't be. This is not a massive opening of the economy. It goes exactly where the, probably the most nationally renowned uh, folks dealing with disease control tells us to go. And that's what this debate is about. So do we stick with the current system, which everyone is frustrated with, or do we adopt a system developed by some of our leading experts on disease control in this nation? I would recommend a yes vote on this bill. Thank you, Mr. President. The chair thanks the senator on the motion. The Mr. clerk will President, call the roll. Mr. President, before uh, you call back, the roll. I'm sorry. Senator Costa. Thank, thank you, sir. Just very briefly, with respect to the, the wording of reckless and irresponsible, I don't believe, in my opinion, that Dr. Levine is saying that the work of the CDC or the work of the CISA, um, CISA, are reckless and irresponsible. I believe what's being, what is meant by those phrases and also by the other concerns that are raised by the other organizations that I mentioned is that the timing, that what we're doing at this point in time is a reckless measure. Not the measure itself, but doing this legislation at this point in time is what is reckless and irresponsible. As I laid out in my remarks, and many of my members have done the same thing, this is not right for prime time. That's what the bottom line is. You all think that it's appropriate to move forward here. The Secretary, as well as many others, disagree. But as no, no reflection on the belief of what the CDC says and does, or the folks at CISA, if I'm saying it properly, indicate what essential businesses are going to be and not be. The fact of the matter is, what we've been through 
and where we're at in this stage of our collective fight in the pandemic is where is what is the concern that has been raised. And we'll continue to be the concern until we hit those benchmarks, until we hit those points in time where it's appropriate for us to be able to move forward. That's what we're talking about in my view, or my belief, or my interpretation of her words in that letter. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair, thanks the Senator. Further on the motion, the Chair recognizes Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. I, look, I understand uh, maybe there's just a difference of opinion, uh, but I don't know how you can characterize this vote as, as um, reckless and irresponsible if we're just adopting the standards of the people who are recommending the, the, or the experts and not saying that their recommendations are not the same. Having said that, we'll just agree to disagree. Uh, Mr. President, can I return to leaves? Leaving the returns of absence, the chair recognizes Senator Corman. I request a capital leave for Senator Brown and a legislative leave for Senator Arnold. Senator Costa, any further leaves? No leaves, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Corman requests legislative leave for Senator Arnold and capital leave for Senator Brown. Without objection, the leaves will be granted. On the motion, the clerk will call the roll. Argyll. Aye. Aye. Arnold. Aye. Almet. Aye. Aye. Baker. Aye. Aye. Bartolotta. Aye. Aye. Blake. No. No. Boscola. No. No. Brewster. No. No. Brooks. Aye. Aye. Brown. Aye. Collette? No. No. Corman? Aye. Costa? No. No. Dinneman? No. No. DeSanto? Aye. Aye. Farnese? No. No. Fontana? No. No. Gordner? Aye. Haywood? No. No. Hughes? No. No. Hutchinson? Aye. Aye. Ivino? No. No. Carney? No. No. Killian? Aye. Aye. Langerholtz? Aye. Aye. Laughlin? Aye. Aye. Leach. Martin. I. Mastriano. I. Mench. I. I. Muth. No. No. Phillips Hill. I. Pittman. I. Regan. I. I. Sabatina. No. No. Senesero. No. No. Scavello. I. Schwank. No. No. Stefano. I. I. Street. No. No. Tartaglione. No. No. Tomlinson. I. I. Vogel. I. I. Ward Judy. I. I. Ward Kim. I. I. Williams Anthony H. No. No. Williams Lindsay. No. No. Y'all. I. I. You did check. I. I. Scarnati. I. Leach. No. No.
vote on concurrence, ayes 29 and nays 21. The amendments are concurred in and the House will be so advised. Chair recognizes Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, notwithstanding the provisions of Senate Rule 12, 12, I move that the Senate proceed to consider Senate Bill 327 contained on Supplemental Calendar Number 2. Senator Corman moves that notwithstanding the provisions of Senate Rule 12, he moves that the Senate proceed to consider Senate Bill 327 contained on Supplemental Calendar Number 2. On the motion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have and the motion is carried. We will now proceed to consideration supplemental calendar number two. The chair recognizes Senator Corman. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that the Senate do concur in amendments made by the House to Senate Bill 327 as amended by the Senate. Senator Corman moves that the Senate do now concur in amendments made by the House to Senate Bill 327 as amended by the Senate. On the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Martin. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise in support of Senate Bill 327 uh, and very briefly just state um, that this pandemic has been a new case of a type of emergency that we have not dealt with in our modern lifetime. The ability to put forth a task force to basically be able to analyze its impact on Pennsylvania, where we can approve, not only will benefit us for the long term, but in the short term if there happens to be any of this virus coming back when the seasons change yet again. Secondly, Mr. President, I also rise in support of the provision in terms of counties being able to make the decisions. Um, I have been a county commissioner for eight years. I have overseen emergency management prior. I've worked hand in hand with the entire emergency operations center team that's tuned in with the business community, tuned in with your local health care systems and the things that are going on in your local communities. County commissioners are more than capable and connected, and I would argue more so than from anywhere up here in Harrisburg in knowing what's best for their communities, the timing of it, and the medical impacts or considerations that need to be given. So I would ask my colleagues to please concur with Senate Bill 327. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Costa. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, I will be brief in my remarks. I want to echo some of the comments I made earlier today, I believe, in committee. But uh, a couple of things concern me about 327. That's why I rise and ask for a negative vote. First and foremost, the provision that was added today that relates to delegating the authority to our county commissioners or county executives and the like in consultation, I presume, with our emergency responders. What that creates, Mr. President, is a situation where theoretically we can have so many different types of uh, issues going on in our counties as it relates to a plan in place for the Commonwealth. It won't be a common plan. It'll be a mismatch of 67 different varieties of what's taken place in each of those counties. And as we know, Mr. President, one of the things that we're seeing right now is the competition among borders. We look to see what Ohio is doing with liquor. We look to see what other states are doing. No doubt those type of competitions for businesses will be taking place as well as we go forward. That's a provision that concerns me. And if we are going to have a directive, my preference is that it come from the Secretary of Health in this Commonwealth in consultation with the administration as we go forward. Second provision, Mr. President, while I recognize and agree and support the notion that uh, we should have an oversight or a task force that was put together, I believe there should be one that, in my view, is deemed to be a balance in terms of representation. This one is not. As I stated earlier, uh, while there would be 10 essential Republican appointments to the legislature, only six among the Democrats in the General Assembly, four from the governor, but the three pivotal ones that make the difference are the ones coming from the court from our Supreme Court, from our Chief Justice in the Supreme Court, Republican Chief Justice, who will have the unfeathered discretion to pick whomever he likes from a couple of different bands of, of courts. To me, that is where the difference lies, and that's where I think it, it provides for an un unbalanced type of a task force that needs to be addressed. 
This third thing, Mr. President, is removing or asking the secretary or the governor to remove himself from dealing with this pandemic for our commonwealth. And whether or not we deal with other states in the eastern part of the country or whether we go west into Ohio and West Virginia and have that conversation, the fact of the matter is removing the governor from opportunities to be able to address this pandemic and requiring him to respond and answer to questions we may have as General Assembly members or task force members, uh, to me, is not appropriate. That conversation should wait until after we do a look back and to see the things that we've done, whether they were done well or whether they were done poorly, and what we can approve upon to ensure that we address the next pandemic and whether or not we have to revisit this one once we get our economy back going, whether or not we have in place the procedures and practices and equipment to allow us to be able to address that. That's where I want to see the governor's attention through this process, but more importantly is the look back being part of that conversation to better equip us as a commonwealth as we go forward. And for those reasons, Mr. President, I ask for a negative vote. Thank you, sir. Chair, thanks, the Senator. Further on the motion, uh, the Chair recognizes Senator Tony Williams. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I um, mentioned in the Schools Committee the math. Um, I'll get even more specific with that. If this is an advisory committee, which I, on the face of it, am not opposed to an advisory committee because I do believe we should be reviewing the facts bearing uh, based upon history and circumstances for the future. Uh, I think that's in the best interest of all people in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But what I don't understand and I can't support is the contradiction in terms of how you arrive at numbers and representation on an advisory committee. Absent the fact that it's Republican versus Democrat, let's get even more specific. If this is an advisory committee and we just voted a bill that talked about all Pennsylvania is not the same and should be treated the same, why would you not have the, this advisory committee, committee represented by those areas that are most impacted? Why would you not have an advisory committee, regardless of Democrat or Republican, I could care less. Why would it not be represented by those most impacted in Pennsylvania by this epidemic to make sure it doesn't happen again? Why would we not be talking about Communities that are impoverished, don't have quality health care, don't have access to testing. Why would we not be talking about the obvious that, unfortunately, African Americans disproportionately are affected by this virus, and we're not quite sure why, given the fact that there's been a rollout of testing sites in those communities, but they've never been tested. There's a hypocrisy in this conversation that people sometimes are quite not quite sure why we treat it in the manner that we do. This is a serious set of circumstances. And I believe everybody's earnest in the humanity. I truly believe that. But when you really get down to reading the details of some of the things we're talking about, there's a not just a gap, there's a chasm of integrity as it relates to how we've gotten to where we are. And so while my colleague talked about the simple difference between Democrats and Republicans, which is stark, I talk about the most obvious. Communities that are being ravaged, if it's a small business, a tiny business, a family business, those who are dying, those don't, will not have a lifeline to come back. Frontline workers, hospital workers, nurses, why would they not be represented in a significant way, frankly, in a majority way on this panel, if it's advisory, investigatory and desirous of finding conclusions that result in solutions going forward. For those obvious reasons, I, I have to rest with my colleague in opposing this. Now that said, I'm more than happy to go back and revisit it if the true work that needs to go into it in terms of its design, its execution, its implementation, and most importantly, its construct to get to a bottom line. So with those issues in mind, I would hope that uh, those who are feeling this is very important to do, get beyond the limitations of the numbers of who's a Democrat, who's a Republican in this building, and get to the true purpose of what supposedly is behind all this, and this is how we help Pennsylvanians going forward after this pandemic has subsided. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair, thanks, Senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Schwenk. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I want to address the aspects of this legislation that gives the authority to counties, and particularly county commissioners or county executives, the authority to open up businesses to make some of these decisions that heretofore have been under the governor's jurisdiction. Like my colleague and friend from Lancaster County, I too was a county commissioner. I was a county commissioner for eight years. And I also was the county commissioner who served on the emergency management team. I was the one who had the direct authority in working with those agencies. The experiences were amazing. The ability to work with people and volunteers, our firefighters, our police on the local level was afforded to me by being able to do that. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. The county commissioners serve with the best intentions and they truly do know what's going on in their communities, probably better than we do, no doubt about it. But I can tell you this, there are two things that we're forgetting here. One is the fact that by saying this, we are literally trans transferring the authority to make these decisions to county commissioners who may not actually even want this authority. Do we know that? Is this something that they desire, that they are going to be making these decisions? I think it's wrong for us to abdicate our responsibility by trying to transfer this authority. And finally, and maybe the most important point is, this virus doesn't respect political boundaries. It's crazy to think that each individual county can make independent decisions in terms of what they'll open up or what they won't open up when they can't see this enemy, when we have no cure, when we don't have enough protective equipment, where the, just think of it, the, the differences in terms of health care from county to county, it varies so much. This is really a wrong move. And I think, I, I will hope, I do hope, that my colleagues reconsider about making this decision. Much as I respect my county commissioner colleagues, and I'll always fondly remember that experience. Back then, I only had to worry about two other votes, not about 49 other votes. But honestly, this is the wrong move to make. This will only exacerbate the problem. And I urge you to vote no on this. Thank you. The chair thanks the senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Mensch. Hey, Mr. President, to be very brief. Uh, <clears throat> we're in the situation we're in because we did approach this logically in a county by county fashion. Uh, we have much diversity across our state, not only racial and economic, it's uh, population density. Um, there, there are many uh, different measures that you can apply to any one uh, political subdivision called a county. We are not mandating to any of the county commissioners that they need to accept this uh, responsibility. They can opt in if they want to. Um, I think it gives greater flexibility to the counties uh, where many of the county commissioners recognize that one size just doesn't fit all. We have some situations where uh, counties were closed uh, early, Montgomery being one of those, uh, where we had many other counties that were still working because we didn't have any of the virus. We're going to see those curves flatten faster in those counties where the virus was late to get to. We're going to see those curves flatten quicker so that we can, um, than, than it would in, say, in Montgomery County. So I think that the com county commissioners deserve the opportunity to make a decision for their citizens whether or not they want to uh, embark on opening businesses. <clears throat> and in the legislation and the amendment, it provides the opportunity for those counties that would begin to do it if they chose, if they decided there wasn't the right track for them, they could cease and desist. They, they don't have to continue with the process. So there, there is a great deal of flexibility here for the county commissioners, but more importantly, there's a great deal of flexibility here for the state. And I think we all care very much about our citizens and we also care very much about that economy. And, uh, you know, if we can get some people back to work safely sooner than others, then I think that it's incumbent on us to recognize that opportunity and to give this power to the commissioners. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Chair, thanks the Senator. Further on the motion, the chair recognizes Senator Farnese.
Thank you, Mr. President. I'll try to be brief. Um, look, there is no question that the circumstances um, that we are operating under right now are, are unprecedented. No one would, would argue with that. Um, and they're historic. But the issues that we're dealing with right now, today, when you boil it down, they deal with, with literally the life and death of the citizens of Pennsylvania. That's what we are dealing with. And we have dealt with issues of this dire importance before, the life and death, the protection, how to keep Pennsylvanians safe. Who is best to make those decisions? Who to extend the authority to make those decisions to? We have done it time and time again, because that's what we do. That is our job. And so while our conditions that we find ourselves in today are certainly historic and unprecedented, the issue which is at hand, the life and death and the safety and how to protect the people of Pennsylvania are issues that we have dealt with in the past. And the fact that we are looking now in a decision on whether or not and how our uh, Pennsylvanians are protected in the middle of a pandemic, that we are willing to say, now is the time to go to our local officials, our local municipalities, because they, in terms of other speakers, you know, they know what is best for their people that they represent. They're on the ground. Mr. President, with all due respect, I have heard that argument time and time and time again in this chamber when folks have put forward bills to protect the wealth of the welfare and health and safety of people in this state. This is not the first emergency disaster situation we have ever had. We have a gun violence epidemic in this state, specifically in Philadelphia. And we have brought the same argument up time and time again. The municipalities and the people that run them at times are best suited to make those decisions, to protect the men and women and the children in those, in those municipalities and those communities. And this chamber and this majority has said no. They have said no. Protection of Pennsylvanians is the same issue today that we have dealt with in the past, specifically when it comes to issues like gun safety, where people are being killed in the streets across this Commonwealth. We need to remember the comments and the reasons that we state here today. Because again, not only of what we're doing here historic, but it does have consequences. We should be voting no on this bill today. We should follow the advice, the sage advice of Dr. Levin. And we should stop having these discussions because I'm going to tell you, I think an earlier speaker said it, you know, we are, we're, not, we're not mandating anything. We're allowing municipalities, we're letting them make a decision based upon guidelines. We are sending a message here today. This is the Senate of Pennsylvania. We are sending a message, whether this bill is passed or not, or signed or not by the governor, this sends a message. And the fact, the fact that we have chosen to have this debate and this discussion at this particular time in this Commonwealth history, yes, Mr. President, I do think that, that rooted, it is, Quite frankly, it is wrong. It is not something that we should be having a debate in the Senate at this time. This is what people are going to see what we're doing here today, and they're going to, we're going to send a message. Mr. President, I'm going to be voting no, because again, like others have said, this is not the time, and this is certainly not the reason. Thank you. Chair thanks the Senator. Further on the motion, the Chair recognizes Senator Argyle. Thank you, Mr. President. I think this really comes down to a, uh, a simple question of who do we trust to decide when our employees and our employers can go back to work. I have heard from some of the county commissioners of the district that I represent here in Berks and Schuylkill counties. They support this legislation. And I really think it just comes down to common sense. The governor has decided to move forward in planning for our future with other governors. 
a select group of other governors, Democrats, not Republicans, uh, governors from our North and our East, not our South and West. We can all speculate as to why he chose to work with some and not others. But in my mind, you know, who should be making these decisions? I certainly believe in this case, when we're talking about our future, our economic future, our health, I think we should trust people in Pottsville and Pine Grove and Reading and Sinking Spring, not people in Rhode Island and Connecticut who couldn't find Tamaqua on a map if their life depended on it. I strongly support a yes vote on this measure. The chair thanks gentlemen. Further on the motion, the clerk will call the roll. Argyle. Aye. 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 Arnold. Uh, Arnold. Aye. Almit. Aye. Aye. Baker. Aye. Aye. Bartolotta. Aye. Aye. Blake. Blake. No. No. Foscola. No. No. Brewster. No. No. Brooks. Aye. Aye. Brown. Aye. Colette. No. No. Corman. Aye. Costa. No. No. Dinneman. No. No. DeSanto. Aye. Aye. Farnese. No. No. Fontana. No. No. Gordner. Aye. Haywood. No. No. Hughes. No. No. Hutchinson. Aye. Aye. Ivino. No. No. Carney. No. No. Killian. Aye. Aye. Langerholtz. Aye. Aye. Laughlin. Laughlin. Aye. Aye. Leach. No. No. Martin. Aye. Mastriano. Aye. Mensch. Aye. Aye. Muth. No. No. Phillips Hill. Aye. Pittman. Aye. Regan. Aye. Aye. Sabatina. No. No. Senecero. No. No. Gavello. Aye. Schwank. No. No. Stefano. Aye. Aye. Street. No. No. Tartaglione. No. Tomlinson. Aye. Aye. Bogle. Aye. Aye. Ward Judy. Aye. Aye. Ward Kim. Aye. Aye. Williams Anthony H. No. No. Williams Lindsay. No. No. Y'all. Aye. Aye. You D check. Aye. Aye. Scarnati. Aye. On the motion, the ayes are 29, the nays are 21, the amendments are concurred in, and this bill will be sent to the House of Representatives for its concurrence in the Senate's further amendments. Reports from committee, Senator Brown, Appropriations Committee, reported, Senate bills reported as committed, Senate Bill 1108, Senate bills reported as, re-reported as committed, 
Senate Bill 1027, Senate Bill 1097, Senate Bill 1106. House bills re-reported as committed, House Bill 752, House bills re-reported as amended, House Bill 1869. Does the chair hear a motion that the Senate proceed to the consideration of all bills reported from committee for the first time at today's session? Senator Martin so moves. So for the information of the members, the clerk will read the bill numbers. Senate Bill 1108. Will the Senate agree to the bill? Agreed to. Next order of business is petitions and remonstrances for the information of the members. Senators Tartaglione and Senator Bartolotta have submitted their remarks for the record. For further remarks, the chair recognizes Senator Deniman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I purposely have wanted to do this at the end and through a remonstrance. Um, we all know uh, the stage upon which we sit and stand today. The outcome we also know even before this debate began. The majority would vote for the two bills that were passed. The governor now will proceed to veto those two bills that have been passed and it will be impossible uh, if uh, on based on partisan lines to override the governor's veto. The question is, what's happened to us as a people? What's happened to us as Americans? When 19 years ago, when 2001, when 9-11 occurred, there was no Democrat, there was no Republican. We united together as one people against an external threat. This external threat of this virus is every bit as much as a 9-11 attack is or any act of war would be upon us. So we are entering a very precious moment of time, a moment when now with the veto, where we can make a decision of whether we're gonna really talk to each other, whether we're really going to solve what is going on. As I listened to my colleagues, everyone spoke with sincerity. Everyone wants to protect the citizens of this Commonwealth. I've served in the Senate for 15 years and I have great respect for the integrity and for the sense of purpose of each and every member of the Senate. But are we going to be able to come together and leadership at the state and national level needs to do this? The threat is too great for us to continue simply to make the votes along partisan lines. The precious moment in time is that we actually have the ability now, if we take it, to have this dialogue, which is so necessary. And I hope we will do that. Um, you know, no one is going back to work unless we solved three problems. And that's where we can unite on. There is not enough testing going on. There is not the enforcement of that testing. And in this Commonwealth, we have not even begun to do what is called uh, what is called uh, tracing, contact tracing. And that's going to require a whole new effort. So at least we can unite on the fact that we need a, a testing re re regimen, that we need to enforce what's out there, that we need to begin, which we haven't, to track down each case by case. And that requires people to do it. And we haven't heard any discussion of that. I say that so that I can take the second of two issues, why I waited for this. I hope that what was put across in the omnibus amendment, that we can all take what Senator Corman promised and make it a reality that there are if this that there are ways that we can work things out if we respect each other and we respect the positions that were stated today there is a way to combine what 
what's called for in 619 with worker protection. And I want to give you an example of what can be done. And this involves what I had put into that amendment. We all agree that there's a lack of testing. Yet in my county, we put up the money. We didn't ask the state for the money. We put up the money to do point of contact testing so that all of our emergency service personnel would be protected. What occurred is we got permission from the Department of Health. And I say this not as criticism, but to demonstrate a dialogue that has to take place. That permission two weeks later after we ordered the point of contact tests was taken away when the Department of Health refused to up to be uh, what is called our I comp the high complex lab partner. It wasn't that they had to do anything. It was that if something wasn't approved yet by the FDA, you needed to have such a partner. Now, the argument was that, uh, we, what, that, that people questioning the point of contact testing. When you don't have enough of the other testing, this is a way to save lives. We wanted it for our emergency service personnel. And we were told, well, we have to wait until this test is approved by FDA. There are currently no tests approved for point of contact testing. Yet, we were willing to put up the funds. We worked with our neighboring counties so that we would have a way to protect our emergency workers. So I'm just trying to say, we have to respect each other, but we also have to listen to the wisdom that comes from all branches and all levels of government. The test, let me just read two things and then conclude. The test, when, it was, when the request was written to the Department of Health, it said, the county went through a due diligence process, which included an evaluation of all of these tests and evaluating the test kits. We found, an, we found a test that, had a, that was the proper test to use. And additionally, the county reviewed lab va validation data and found that Avite performed well in comparison to other manufacturers. Now, we, on one hand, can't get this through. And there are no point of contact tests right now. Um, the manufacturer, a Pennsylvania manufacturer who represents the biotech strength of our Commonwealth here in our suburban area, has submitted their test uh, on a, uh, to food and drug. We don't know whether this will come back in one week or two weeks. What are other states doing? Just to show you how we all have to listen to each other, how if we don't have the regular tests, we have to try other things. We have to listen to our counties. We have to listen to everyone and have this dialogue together. Let me read you something. It was announced today by the governor of Arizona that the test that the state will offer antibody tests for healthcare workers and first responders across the state. The state investment will allow, uh, will, uh, will allow the University of Arizona to test 250,000 Arizona frontline workers. These are the people, by the way, who might not have the symptoms. We are using these tests, by the way, in our prisons and in our nursing home successfully. Let me read you one other thing. The test will determine how many people have been exposed to, the, to, to coronavirus and have successfully built an, an immunity against it. Experts say as many as 50% of the people who have been exposed to this virus have experienced few or no symptoms. Such testing is being used in Los Angeles County, California, in Palm Beach County, Florida, in San Miguel County, Colorado, in Genesee County, Michigan. And today I read, I guess it's good if you have money because the wealthiest place in the United States, Fisher Island, Florida, is that just purchased these tests so they would be protected. Mr. President, what I'm trying to say is this. Let's not waste this moment in time. 
let's try to restore what we found in this nation in 2001. That requires us on all levels, not simply to repeat partisan positions. That we knew what the result would be today. We know it will be vetoed. Let's use this precious moment in time to come together. And Mr. President, let's make sure that we really listen to each other. We're frustrated as, as Chester Countyans when we want to protect our emergency service workers, when we put up the money, and yet we don't have an answer. And this is not a criticism so much of the Department of Health. Dr. Levine is a hero for all of us. Tom Wolf is doing his best. But it is saying that unless we talk to each other, we cannot have the unity of response, which we saw in 2001, we yet can be the greatest generation of the 21st century. We can do what Americans did in World War II, what we did at, in, in terms of 9-11 in 2001, if we only begin this dialogue together. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to my colleagues for allowing me, instead of speaking on the floor for one bill or another, to make this plea here today. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair, thanks the Senator. Um, for further comments, the Chair recognizes Senator Lisa Baker. No comments. No comments at this time. Chair, thanks the Senator. Chair lays before the Senate Senate bills entitled number to refer as follows, which the clerk will read. Wednesday, April 15th, Senate Bill 1113 referred to finance, Senate Bill 1114 referred to banking and insurance, and Senate Bill 1115 referred to community, economic, and recreational development. The Chair wishes to announce that I have signed in the presence of the Senate, Senate Bill 613. Senator Corman for recess. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now recess to the call of the President pro tempore. Senator Corman moves that the Senate now recess to the call of the President pro tempore. On the motion, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have, and the Senate stands in recess until the call of the President pro tempore. <laughs>